the uh, meeting will be in order. There's been, uh, at first, if I may, Mr. Solomon, Mr. Goss, Slaughter, uh, been a request for the taking of still photographs during today's hearing. Is there any objection to that? No objection. And there's also been a request for filming of portions of today's proceedings. Is there objection to no. that? There being none, uh, both will be approved. Our chairman, Mr. Mokley, will be along in just a very few moments. He's, he's um, detained, unfortunately, in another meeting and has asked us to start. And, and we will start, if I may, by, by uh, reading the statement Mr. Mokley would have made had he been here. I know. We're going to give you time in just a moment, Jerry. So this is Mr. Mokley's statement. The Rules Committee convenes this morning to hear from the House members of the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress, who for the past year have devoted countless hours to intensive study of this institution. These members and their staff deserve a great deal of praise for their dedication to this extremely complicated task. The committee organized what appeared to be uh, an overwhelming mandate into a coherent, vigorous hearing schedule. And perhaps most impressive was the committee's ability to distill the enormous amounts of information gathered through their hearings to produce the reform package we have before us today. This praise is not to say that I will agree with everything in the bill as introduced, nor will the general membership. Already we've heard cries of protest concerning the Joint Committee's recommendation to adopt a biennial appropriation schedule and to further reduce the size of committees and the number of committee assignments allowed each member. These issues, in light of the radical impact they would have on this institution, will require further examination. We need to ensure that any changes we make constitute improvement rather than empty gestures made merely for the appearance of change. The Rules Committee's subcommittees will hold hearings on these issues and others starting in late February, affording members the opportunity to voice their concerns regarding the specific, specific recommendations of the Joint Committee. H.R. 3801 may not be perfect. Some say it goes too far, while others say it doesn't go far enough. But let's make an effort to accomplish something. By something, I mean implementing procedures and changes that will make this House run more effectively and efficiently and improve the public's understanding of the institution. The Joint Committee members appear before the Rules Committee today to provide us with an overview of their final recommendations and to perhaps explain the rationale behind some of their provisions. I thank them for their time and look forward to working with them over the next few months toward accomplishing meaningful reform. And at this time, I'd like to hear from our ranking minority member, gentleman from New York, Mr. Solomon. Well, I thank the, uh, the gentleman from California who is filling in for our able chairman, uh, Chairman Moakley, who couldn't be here. Mr. Chairman, I am a uh, member of the uh, Joint Committee, and I'll reserve most of my remarks for uh, testimony that I will give uh, a few minutes uh, later on. But uh, first of all, I want to commend you and Chairman Moakley and other members of our Rules Committee for scheduling these, uh, these timely hearings. And uh, Mr. Chairman, if you, uh, if you recall, uh, two years ago, there was uh, a complete breakdown of comity uh, in the House of Representatives. Uh, there, was, there was the word gridlock. A lot of it was blamed uh, on the differences between the White House and Congress, two different political parties. Uh, but there was also gridlock within the legislative process that prevented major concerns of the American people from being considered on the floor of the House of this, uh, Representatives. Uh, legislation such as um, uh, drugs, illegal drugs, which is just a scourge in this country today that is killing hundreds of thousands of our children and young adults. and. Uh, and even older people. Uh, legislation dealing with drugs tied up in 15 different committees and 20 subcommittees. Uh, there was an absolute gridlock in the legislative process. And that's when the Republican and Democrat leadership got together uh, to try to correct the, the, uh, the problems that create this gridlock. Because it is not so much uh, the difference between political parties as it is uh, the legislative process that just does not work. And in the resolution that established this joint committee under the able leadership of uh, Chairman Hamilton, who, uh, who I served with for many years on the Foreign Affairs Committee and one of the most respected members of this House, and David Dreyer, who is a member of our Rules Committee, uh, an outstanding member, uh, they were charged, and our joint committee was charged, with being bold and trying to reform this House. Unfortunately, as I look at the piece of legislation that is before us today that we're going to be holding hearings on, uh, I personally don't feel that this is a bold effort to, to, to reform this House. Uh, we seem to be so uh, uh, hesitant to step on the toes of committee chairmen 
be they Democrats uh, or ranking members, be they Republicans. And if we're ever going to have reform, the very word reform means that you step on the toes of people. So I'm just hopeful that uh, in the hearings that we're going to be uh, holding today uh, and in March as well, uh, that we're going to be able to take this bill, which is a step in the right direction, take it to the floor and let 435 members of this Congress work its will to try to break the gridlock that is really paralyzing us. So having said all that, I really look forward to the testimony from uh, uh, the chairman and the ranking member of, of our joint committee and the other members that will follow. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Mr. Slaughter, Mr. Goss, do you, either of you feel impelled to speak at this time or uh, should we go to Just the one comment, if I may, Mr. Chairman, some of the reforms that we passed last year in the Democrat caucus, uh, one of them that I prize mostly is the fact that we said we would only hear from chairs and ranking members so that we would not keep witnesses waiting all day, and I'd be happy to abide by that. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'll be equally brief. Uh, we do have uh, an awful lot of work product that's been put into this. I had the privilege and honor of testifying before the committee on one narrow aspect of the matters they deliberated over. I know other members of Congress are very, very interested in this, as is the American public. Uh, the type of provisions they've talked about, things like congressional compliance with all federal laws, are, are clearly going to hit responsive chords and clearly going to start some interesting debate in the House. But uh, the good part of this is that I cannot think of more genuine, concerned, dedicated people that have performed this task. And I say that uh, with great respect and admiration. Lee Hamilton is known as perhaps the foremost and most respected voice on foreign affairs matter. In fact, I wish it were a louder voice. Uh, many of us do. Uh, and heard more often. Uh, but to take on these additional roles, I compliment you and I look forward to these hearings and hope it leads somewhere. Thanks, Thank Mr. you, Mr. Goss. Chairman. I, I too had the privilege of testifying for about an hour before their committee and unfortunately some of my suggestions do not appear in this. But nonetheless, come on up and explain yourselves. Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Dreyer, it's good to have you both here. The nice, the kind words that Mr. Goss said about you are absolutely true and everybody else feels that way as well. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stevenson and uh, members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be with you, and we appreciate the gracious remarks that have been made. Uh, I have a statement, of course. I'll ask you to enter that into the Without record objection, full, we'll be, if you would. It will be introduced uh, to the record. First, let point. me say that I think the members of the Joint Committee with whom I served, and uh, two of them are here, Mr. Solomon and Mr. Dreyer, uh, did their task very well. Uh, they did their work well, and I express my particular appreciation to David Dreyer. He's been a delightful member to work with. We've had good cooperation throughout. Uh, both he and I have, I think, have had rather difficult roles to play uh, as we've tried to bring these reform recommendations forward. It's a great pleasure to work with him, as it has been with uh, our Senate counterparts, uh, Senator Boren and Senator Domenici. Uh, I do want to thank the members of the Joint Committee for their contribution and uh, the many members of the Congress who testified uh, at our hearings. Uh, many spoke to me informally and to other members of the committee and uh, contributed to our efforts. Uh, I also want to say that the uh, Democratic and Republican leadership of the House were consulted throughout the work of the Joint Committee. Uh, they, of course, can speak for themselves with regard to how they feel about uh, the recommendations of the committee. Uh, but there isn't any doubt in my mind that uh, the leadership of both parties is uh, committed to uh, institutional renewal and to reform. Uh, we did have a very ambitious schedule, uh, 36 days of hearings, 144 hours of testimony, 240 witnesses. Uh, we had one uh, unique day in the American legislative history uh, when we had the Speaker of the House and the majority and minority leaders from the, both chambers testify on one day. That's never happened before in the history of the Congress. Uh, we surveyed members of Congress to try to get a sense of what they thought about reform. We surveyed members of the congressional staffs about the options that were before us. They had all kinds of symposiums conducted, uh, many involving members, many not. We were helped greatly by Dr. Thomas Mann of the Brookings Institution and Dr. Norman Ornstein of the American Enterprise Institute. They gave us very valuable help. Uh, likewise, the Carnegie Commission on Science, Technology, and Government was extremely helpful to us. So we, we had a lot of uh, input from a variety of sources, and we appreciated that uh, very much. 
Now, uh, the reform recommendations that I'm testifying to this morning were reported by the members of the Joint Committee in November of 1993. Uh, all of us who have been part of this process have learned that it's a treacherous one. Uh, reform, everybody favors reform in general, but when specifics are addressed, it becomes just extremely difficult to build a consensus around a single package. Uh, nonetheless, my sense is that the Joint Committee has made an important contribution uh, to the reform effort for several uh, reasons. Uh, one is that our recommendations, I believe, are meaningful. Uh, I would go so far, Mr. Chairman, as to say that if the recommendations as they stand in this bill are adopted by the House of Re Representatives, it would be the most significant reform this institution has seen in decades. Uh, so it's meaningful. Uh, from applying the laws to Congress to streamlining the institution, our recommendations for reform constitute major change, even if not a, a comma is changed in the, the bill. Of course, all of us know that many commas will be changed. Second, the reform plans reported by the Joint Committee provide both chambers with a bicameral core of recommendations for change. And due to the constraints of time, the difficult nature of the reform issues, the House and Senate members of the Joint Committee proceeded al along separate uh, but parallel tracks in finalizing specific reform recommendations. We did work closely with our Senate counterparts during most of the panel's deliberations. And if you look at the two packages, they are relatively similar. A third, every single proposal in the package is bipartisan. Uh, that's because of the way the Joint Committee was set up. The resolution that created the Joint Committee clearly indicated that all of the panel's recommendations would have to have bipartisan support. And as intended, the recommendations we're discussing here this morning are not Democratic proposals or Republican proposals. These rec no recommendations could have passed with just the support of Democrats or just the support of Republicans. Instead, these recommendations derive from the concerns and votes of members from both political parties. Fourth, I think the recommendations in the package are politically realistic. Reform efforts historically typically end in failure. This year, it is particularly important that Congress pass meaningful reform. And I think it's important that we not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. The reform package should be judged on its merits and political realism, not by some unattainable ideal. Uh, there's insufficient time for me to discuss every single recommendation, but allow me to summarize what I at least would call the highlights of the House package. Applying the laws to Congress in a manner consistent with separation of powers, involving private citizens in the House ethics process in a meaningful way, fundamentally uh, alter the f federal budget process by putting it on a two-year rather than an annual cycle, cut congressional staff by as much as 12 percent, streamline the committee system by reducing assignments and cutting the number of subcommittees, open up Congress to more public scrutiny by, for example, publicizing special interest projects and in committee reports, a reform that will provide, I think, a major disincentive to wasteful spending, guaranteeing to the minority party the right to offer a full policy alternative on all legislation considered on the House floor. There are dozens of worthwhile proposals, I believe, in the package, and I mention only a few of them. I recognize that some members are concerned that the House and Senate sides of the Joint Committee choose not to recommend a comprehensive realignment of committee jurisdiction in either chamber. Uh, however, had our recommendations included a plan to dramatically realign committees, the Joint Committee process, in my judgment, and this has to be a subjective judgment, of course, would likely have ended in defeat, as have other prior reform efforts that addressed comprehensive committee realignment. Instead, both plans adopt an incentives-based approach to committee reform. Uh, for the House, what that means is that we would limit members to two full committees and four subcommittees, put assignment limitations in House rules, and making individual waivers difficult to obtain, exempting only the Standards Committee from the assignment limitations because of its special function limiting the number of subcommittees to five on major committees and four on non-major committees, and requiring that if the membership of a standing committee falls 50 per, 
falls below 50% of its level in the 103rd Congress. The Rules Committee then would consider a resolution abolishing the committee and transferring its jurisdiction to another panel. The incentives-based approach to committee reform has several substantive advantages relative to the traditional moving around the boxes approach to jurisdictional change. It sets in motion a process by which committee structures and jurisdictions can be altered as issues rise or fall in importance over time as national priorities. The incentives-based approach allows members themselves to decide which committees and jurisdictions are important rather than relying on rigid decisions about committee priorities made by members of a reform panel, decisions that might be out of date within a few years anyway. For the incentives-based proposal to achieve these goals, however, it is critical that the specific recommendations, particularly those limiting committee assignments, not be seriously weakened as the reform process continues. I recognize that many members are concerned that the Senate reform plan f failed to address fully the problem of Senate floor procedure, uh, a major source of gridlock in Congress. The Senate members of the Joint Committee did recommend an end to filibusters on the motion to take up a bill. But even if this proposal is accepted by the Senate, five distinct points remain where any bill can be filibustered. The Senate package also fails to address adequately the problem of non-germane amendments. My hope is that these limitations in the Senate plan will be corrected as the reform process continues. I understand, of course, that the package of proposals that I have introduced is not the last word on congressional reform. No single reform can resolve all the problems that confront Congress, nor can any single reform plan please everyone. The mandate of the Joint Committee was daunting in its breadth, and our authorization period was just one year. It was inevitable that many important issues would not receive the attention they deserve. The process of institutional renewal is a continuing effort, and it will last far beyond the life of the Joint Committee. We should accomplish now what we can, and later build on these accomplishments. And of course, reform takes place in many uh, areas in this uh, institution. Uh, your member, Mrs. Slaughter from New York, heads an important uh, committee in the Democratic Caucus that is the source of many reform proposals. So it's not just the Joint Committee, for example, that deals with reform. At this point, the Joint Committee has reported its recommendations, and it's gone out of business. The reform effort now shifts to the committees of jurisdiction, the party caucuses, and the full House and the Senate, and of course to this committee, Mr. Chairman. My hope is that our recommendations will be strengthened, not weakened, as they move through the legislative process. Deliberations on the Legislation Reorganization Act of 1994 provide members with a unique window of opportunity to consider and adopt major changes in the way this institution conducts its business. We should take advantage of this opportunity. My view is that the rule governing floor consideration in the House should permit full consideration of the major reform alternatives. We must also be wary of reform ideas that, if adopted, would seriously undermine this institution's ability to fulfill its historic role as the first branch of government. We need to remember that emerging democracies across the world are modeling their own legislatures after the United States Congress. Proposals that would weaken the institution, in my view at least, do not constitute reform. We must continue to be particularly mindful of unintended consequences of reform. Uh, the committee reforms of the 70s, in which I participated, for example, were intended to democratize the House, but I think most people would now say they complicated the process of coalition building. Consideration of the major reform options should be structured to ensure that deliberations are careful and thorough and balanced. Let me conclude. I support this package, and I support each recommendation in it. My view is that, if accepted, the recommendations of the House members of the Joint Committee would constitute the most significant reform of this institution in decades. But I also recognize how difficult it is to put a reform package together. I have come to appreciate how personal congressional reform is to members of Congress and how powerfully specific proposals can affect a member. Each member looks at the package and asks, how does it affect him or her, as indeed they should. I hope they will also ask another question. 
How does it affect the institution? Will these recommendations or any single recommendation make Congress a better institution? That really is the test that ought to be applied. The individual concerns of members certainly need to be listened to and accommodated when possible. I'll make every effort to do that. We cannot, of course, guarantee each member a satisfactory result from his or her point of view. I do think it's critical that reform effort proceed in a timely fashion. I don't think we should walk away from this package. Failing to pass a comprehensive reform bill this year would be a blow to the prestige of the 103rd Congress, and I think open all of us to some criticism. We all recognize that institutional reform is no panacea, but the passage this year of meaningful reform uh, legislation would help demonstrate that members of the Congress are serious about trying to enhance uh, the effectiveness of the institution. I do not share the view that others have that the Congress is in shambles, but I do take the view that we can do better. And I look forward to working with this committee, its subcommittees, the other committees, the caucuses, and groups in this institution that in support improvements in the legislative branch. I think we can strengthen Congress's performance and credibility and help ensure that this institution remains what it has been for 200 years the strongest independent legislative body uh, in the world. I right, thank you. The, the uh, joint committee is out of business. Is out of business. Yeah. So your uh, ability to help would not be as chairman of the committee, but would be That's as That's right. A, That's as correct. As I, and from this point on, I'm not acting as... Uh, chairman of the committee of the joint committee I'm simply acting as the former uh, committee chairman who has an interest in these matters and will try to push them forward okay well I think we should hear from the former vice chairman of the committee mr. Dreyer thank you very much mr. <coughs> chairman um, let me say at the outset that uh, last May you testified before our committee we all enjoyed it uh, we've gone through a very close scrutiny of the testimony that you provided for the committee and found that you were right on target with one of your predictions, that being that the Tigers would not win the pennant. And uh, the, the Red Sox didn't either, and we all certainly wish you well next year. As was said, there were several other members of this Rules Committee who testified before the Joint Committee, and uh, we appreciated that. Mr. Chairman, uh, the civil rights leader, Martin Luther King, in referring to the struggle for equal rights for African Americans, said something that I think aptly applies to the situation that does exist in Congress today. He said, the soft-minded man always fears change. He feels security in the status quo, and he has an almost morbid fear of the new. For him, the greatest pain is the pain of a new idea. And Mr. Chairman, a morbid fear of the new is how I would describe the Joint Committee's recommendations. Member surveys and testimony we heard before our committee from both Democrats and Republicans indicate an overwhelming demand for comprehensive reform. In the end, however, uh, the committee was really afraid to take that chance. Our bill, which is uh, H.R. 3801, reported out of the committee, represents the security of the status quo. Let me add that, in my view, the bill is uh, inadequate in spite of, not because of the efforts, of my good friend Lee Hamilton. He did uh, an exceptional job of keeping the Joint Committee together and directing our work to completion under difficult circumstances. Uh, Chairman Hamilton has been steadfastly committed to the reform process, and it was a pleasure to work with him, and I should say it was a real challenge to fill the shoes of Bill Gratison, who, uh, when he uh, retired, uh, played a role in encouraging me, as did others, to take on this uh, responsibility. Let me also uh, be the first to say, Mr. Chairman, that there are some very notable provisions, as, as Lee has mentioned in the bill, uh, which we should recognize. For example, uh, as he said, committee and subcommittee assignment limitations will address the concern that too many assignments undermine the ability of members to fully deliberate issues in committee. The subcommittee restrict restrictions of no more than five for exclusive and major committees and no more than four for all minor committees will reduce scheduling conflicts, 
policy fragmentation and the decentralization of authority. Allowing private citizens to investigate charges of ethics violations will enhance public confidence in Congress and alleviate the time burdens and conflicts that ethics committee's members uh, have in our current self-disciplinary system. Requiring the publication of committee attendance and voting records will create an incentive for members to attend meetings and formal markups, and I believe will improve, improve deliberation. Going to a two-year budget cycle for, authoriz for both authorizations and appropriations will improve committee oversight and planning and will reduce the amount of time devoted to budgeting. Finally, the provision requiring Congress to live by the same laws as every other American is, I believe, a step, but it's a small step, in the right direction. I believe this provision needs to be strengthened to include mandatory compliance with OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, de novo review by courts, and punitive damages. For the most part, however, the reforms in H.R. 3801 are either illusory or key areas of reform are really missing altogether. Let me give you some examples of what I mean here, Mr. Chairman. There is no committee reform to speak of. Uh, considering that the Joint Committee devoted more of its time and resources to this issue than any other, it is clearly the most noteworthy failure. Most of the problems cited by witnesses and colleagues, such as duplication, overlapping, and out-of-date jurisdictions, too many committees, micromanagement of the executive branch, and the inability to deal with contemporary problems were not addressed by the Joint Committee. The bill requires the identification of special interest earmarks in committee reports. This is a good informational tool, but it does not reduce the ability to use earmarks or reduce the obstacles to removing these special interest items from a bill. While the Joint Committee reaffirms the original intent of the rule on the motion to recommit, as adopted in 1909 to guarantee the minority a final amendment to a bill prior to passage, this is not an expansion of minority rights. The bill does not mandate any legislative branch staff reductions. Let me repeat that. This bill does not mandate any legislative branch staff reductions, despite the creation of a task force and a so-called streamlining and restructuring formula. The bill does not restrict the use of proxy voting. 19 of 23 committees in the House permit members to vote without... Yet in the regular committees where most legislation is developed and refined and a member's impact is most felt, transferring the equivalent of one's voting card is considered necessary for conducting business. This makes absolutely no sense. Thanks to your leadership, Mr. Chairman, our Rules Committee is one of the four House committees that does not permit proxy voting. We meet uh, as often as five or six or more times a week and we manage quite well without proxies. Of course, we do sometimes wait, and Mr. Quillen will certainly attest to this, for a, a great deal of time for a quorum to be developed, but that's the price we pay to ensure our, that our committee fully deliberates. But we do want to encourage you to regularly work hard to get the quorum here so we can proceed. Proxy voting has no place in a modern legislature because it undermines consensus. It undermines the integrity of the committee system, and it undermines accountability and public confidence in Congress. Mr. Chairman, some of my other Joint Committee colleagues uh, who are going to be testifying today on other areas will touch on other areas where the bill is deficient. But before I conclude, I want to mention two other issues. First, the House does not have any jurisdiction over Senate procedures. So raising the issue of the Senate filibuster can only be interpreted by many as a weak attempt to kill reform in the House. It is an off-speed pitch designed to fool people into thinking that all of our problems can be solved by undermining deliberation as it exists in the Senate. The second issue has to do with the growing problems of Rules Committee resolutions that severely restrict amendments and waive points of order. Needless to say, I hope that we won't be faced with such a rule when this bill is brought to the floor. It would be a travesty to consider so-called reform legislation under a business-as-usual procedure. I'll try to dwell not too much on this because uh, you've heard my complaints uh, more than a few times, and I'm sure that our other witnesses will certainly touch on the problem. I suspect Mr. Solomon will. But I do want to respond to something that you did say in your testimony uh, when you came before our committee, Mr. Chairman. You said, 
While House rules and procedures generally recognize the importance of permitting any minority, partisan, or bipartisan to present its views and prepare alternatives, the rules do not enable that minority to filibuster or use other devices to prevent the majority from accomplishing its objectives in a timely manner. There is absolutely no disputing your statement, Mr. Chairman, but if the rules of the House do not permit obstructionist tactics, it should not be necessary for our Rules Committee to consistently manipulate and ignore them. H.R. 3801 does not begin to address the problem of rules abuses, which I believe undermine both political accountability and the whole concept of representative government. The Joint Committee and the Organization of Congress had the unique opportunity to do something that has not been done in nearly half a century. That is to create the framework for a modern Congress capable of, dressing, of addressing contemporary problems. The structure of today's Congress was developed for a post-World War II America, when government resources were plentiful, our enemy was the Soviet Union, the biggest social problem in our public schools was chewing gum in class, and today's fiercely competitive and innovative industries, which are dealing in a global economy, were in their infancy. If you look at just one contemporary issue, which comes very close to me, and that is natural disasters, you'll see how Congress is ill-equipped to deal with the modern problems. While the government has gotten better at responding to natural disasters, federal aid is not effective in rapidly restoring the viability of stricken communities. Congress repeatedly goes through internal battles over how to pay for disaster aid, and no single committee has the authority to develop a coherent disaster relief policy. The Joint Committee was in a unique position to address these types of deficiencies. It was bipartisan and bicameral, the two necessary ingredients in any recipe for change. But the Committee's work fell victim to a vocal minority who want to wallow in the security of the status quo. Now, the decision on whether to accomplish the minimalist approach contained in H.R. 3801 or to construct a new and, I hope, comprehensive reform plan rests right here in our Rules Committee. Normally, I would not hold out much hope that we could come to a bipartisan consensus, because how could a committee where Democrats outnumber Republicans 9 to 4 succeed where a strictly bipartisan joint committee failed? But I know that with the possible exception of floor procedures, many of my Rules Committee colleagues, and Mr. Bielenson said this earlier, on the Democrat side share many of the same views as those of us on the Republican side. I believe a bipartisan and comprehensive reform plan is still possible. That's why I voted to report the legislation out so we could keep the process of reform in motion, and I will work diligently with Lee Hamilton and any other member of this House who wants to continue to proceed in our attempt to find a common ground on major areas of reform. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I was very interested in your statement regarding the restriction of committees. As you well know, when a member gets elected to Congress, he goes to the powers to be and says, you've got to put me on this committee, I've got to get reelected, and, and it's usually uh, they, they make another slot on this committee or they fill them in on, on a temporary basis. So the present system really uh, contributes uh, to the opposite of what you're trying to do in your uh, proposal here. Have you thought of that? Uh, Dick Bowling used to say if he were ever the speaker and somebody came looking for a spot on agriculture, he'd put him on banking. Yeah. <laughs> you got that fellow up there on the wall? Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> and I think um, the common complaint that uh, Dave and I receive from members probably more than any other is we're overloaded. We just have three committees scheduled at 10 o'clock every morning and uh, three more at 2 o'clock and all the rest of it, which is a familiar litany to all of you. And uh, I don't know that I can ever recall a member around this institution refusing any uh, assignment. I was going to say, if they're uh, overloaded, it's probably because they requested those well, committees. Well, that's the nature of the politician. Hmm. Uh, we, we all seek more responsibility and we seek uh, more uh, influence and, to put it more bluntly, we seek more power. And so when we have an opportunity for an assignment, we take it, whether or not we can fulfill it. And we ask for additional staff to help us out. Now, that's the way this institution runs, and that's the way these schedules get uh, enormously crowded. 
Uh, I think what has to be done here is to make it very tough uh, for a person to take on additional assignments and to put it into the rules and to make sure those rules are not waived. Uh, or it won't work. This incentives-based approach we have to the committee jurisdiction, which incidentally, uh, Mr. Dreyer described this as the status quo and made quite a point that committee reform here was not very um, powerful. Uh, he thought it was, I think, a, a noteworthy failure. But let me just say that as members begin to understand this incentives-based approach, they're getting very, very worried. And they're coming to me, and it looks to me like it's a system that would bite because they're beginning to complain about the impact of it on their position. And so I th I've come to the conclusion that they're taking it pretty seriously now as a means of uh, shifting their responsibilities in this institution. If I could yeah. respond, uh, Mr. Chairman. First, let me say that, that there are 266 committees and subcommittees for the 535 members of Congress. And we on the Republican side often joke that if we're walking down the hall and happen to see a Democrat whose name we don't know, we just say, how you doing, Mr. Chairman, because chances are he or she chairs some committee or subcommittee in this institution. And uh, what I referred to, I referred to what we ended up with, incentive-based change is the status quo, because uh, I uh, sat there while the Congressional Research Service provided us 14 different, very detailed plans major restructuring of the committee process. And it seems to me that this is, and I'm not going to say was, but this still is because I think we can do it if we can get a rule on the floor that allow us to bring forth a major committee reform package. This is the time for us to look at a way in which we can bring about major reductions in the numbers of committees and, as I said in my statement, try to get at this whole issue of bringing Congress into the, uh, into the 21st century. I mean, we're just years away from the millennium here, and it seems to me that we've got a very important responsibility. In the past, Congress is, uh, many decades ago, every 10 years or so, would bring about major change of the committee process. Lee and I were on a television program on this issue of reform, and I'll never forget a statement that was made. He said when he first came to the Congress, there was not a single committee to deal with energy, the environment. Uh, I, there were a couple of other issues that you made. And you said, since you've been here, what we have seen is a tremendous increase in the numbers of committees to deal with those issues. And we have not seen a concurrent decrease in the numbers of other committees, many of which I believe are outmoded or could be merged in other areas. So that's why I think that incentive-based change, and it all sounds great, but it seems to me that we need to be much bolder, for lack of a better term, now as we move ahead with this. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I make a point here? Mr. Chairman, you can come up with the best uh, alignment of the jurisdictional boxes in the world. You can make a, it's possible to set up a plan here where the organizational charts and the boxes will be perfect. Uh, and it'll be out of date in a few years. Because the issues before the country change. Now, what we're trying to do is to put in place a system that will roll with the times, that will have flexibility, and will be based on the member's own judgment as to what's important and what is not important. And that's what this incentives-based system is all about. It's a rolling system. It's a very, very flexible system. And uh, I think it's based, uh, I, and, and I think it would effectively reduce the number of member assignments, and it would lead over a period of time to downsizing of the committee structure of the Congress. I'd have no problem with the idea of incentive-based changes. If we'd have, well, if we'd have a major reform of the status quo before we put those incentive-based changes into place. Mr. Bielinson. You all faced a daunting task and, and did an immense amount of, of, of work, and you're to be commended for it. It's hard to imagine the, the I guess, literally hundred, hundreds of ideas and proposals that you had before, and had to, before you and had to shift, sift through, and it must have been a terribly difficult 
um, job, even if it weren't for necessity of, of forging some agreement amongst yourselves. Just even if you if you had your druthers, could do anything you wanted, you'd probably have a very difficult time figuring out exactly what what you would like to to do. I think at the outset, it's useful to remind ourselves that there are some limits to reform in the first place. Uh, not only in terms of the fact that we, we reform ourselves, and I guess other, inst other institutions do every decade or more or, or so, but uh, in and of itself, just changing procedures or changing, you know, uh, changing the, the face of the institution, as a word, does not necessarily lead to, to better um, work. So that, that's something I think we should, we should keep in mind. There, there are other things that are necessary, other than reform, as you all sort of have, have looked at it and as, is, as it's been presented to you. Uh, we can always use, for example, and this is not meant as a and kind of personal criticism, we can always use better leadership in any institution from the majority and the minority side. We can use, to a certain extent, better followership, especially on our side. You all seem to stick together better than Democrats do, but if the Democrats stuck together better, uh, we'd get a lot more work done. You all might not like what we did, but we but we'd, we'd get a lot more done. Uh, it's always been this member's opinion that what we lack most of all in this institution is the willingness of an adequate number of members to do real legislative work, uh, especially the newer members. I don't mean to be picking on them, but I think they've been miseducated to a certain extent just by what they see of politics or have seen of them in the years prior to their running. People come here and spend all of their time making one-minute speeches and running home and calling in the press and introducing bills which can't ever pass. Uh, those of you who've served in this legislature for some period of time or in other legislatures back home know that the real work of a legislature, any legislature, is done in committee. Uh, it's my guess that we probably only have 100 and 125 members out of 435 who are serious people and who give enough of their personal time uh, to their committee work. Uh, you, can, you can look at almost any committee of this House. And uh, it's not just a question of scheduling or being on too many committees or subcommittees. Uh, but an awful lot of members don't show up. It's one of the reasons, obviously, for proxy voting. That's why I'm sorry, at least, that we didn't do something about that, and perhaps we can do, do something about it. So I think there are some other, some, some other aspects of looking at this which perhaps aren't, aren't reflected in, in your report. I also think it's true what Mr. Hamilton says. I guess, Dave, you don't quite agree with him, but um, in some respects, we do an awful lot better job than the Senate. The filibuster is a serious problem, which we can't here address. The lack of a germaneness rule in the Senate is a hideous problem. In the opinion of everybody here, we sometimes waive the germaneness rule, rule, as you all know, in this committee. But on the whole, we, we try pretty hard to stick to it. It makes a lot of difference. When bills come back, you know, dressed up as Christmas trees with all kinds of things on them, they come from the Senate, not from the House, ordinarily. People back home don't know the distinction, but in fact, that, that in fact is, um, is true. There, there are an enormous number of things to speak to you about and talk to you about, and I've already taken up probably more time than I should have, but just a couple of specific questions, if, if I may. If you had your druthers, for example, as to restructuring the committee structure, what would you do? I mean, if, I guess you have to imagine that we were starting from scratch. And nobody had been elected before. Nobody had any seniority. Nobody had any chairmanships or something. Um, do, do, were you able to, some, one of you mentioned that somebody presented 14 different methods or something. Or is, is, there, is there a sensible way uh, that, that most of us could agree on, putting aside our own personal involvement that, that you could uh, come up with a, with a rational committee structure? Obviously, it, it is a challenge. And uh, as Jerry said in his opening remarks, uh, there are going to be some people who will be offended by it. I mean, Lee said that there are people who were, he didn't say offended, but concerned about even incentive-based changes today. So I, mean, I think we have to look at the issue of committee reform and assume there are going to be people who are not particularly happy with it, number one. Number two, I provided a, a substitute on committee structure reform, which was took in aspects of the 14 proposals that were before us, took in aspects of the Renewing uh, Congress project, uh, which Lee mentioned uh, at, at the outset, Tom Mann and Norm Ornstein uh, uh, put that together. And we tried to come up with something that would, based on what I said in my remarks, bring us to uh, the 21st century. And uh, I, I mean, I can provide for you an outline of the details. Would you have, come up, would you have ended up with, with a smaller number of yes, committees? Would, yeah, we as went well as change jurisdiction. From 22 down to uh, 16 committees in the, in the package that we offer. Well, even assuming, Dave, for purposes of argument, that that proposal would have been more rational, made a lot more sense, point of view of most of us. Um, is it also true, do you think? I mean, think about it for a moment. Is it also true that if somehow we could magically enforce that, that proposal, that 
that the work of the Congress would be better, do you think? I would like to think that it could. I mean, you know, I, I agree with Lee. I'm not one. I don't spend my time bashing this institution. No, I mean, no. I think it's a great place. I think that uh, it is clearly the greatest deliberative body known to man. But we all must acknowledge that uh, there are many in the electorate who believe that we uh, are really not responding to the needs of the American people. I mean, the opinion. Let, let, let me say something dangerous. Is, Put aside for a moment, if we may. I don't really mean this, mm -hmm. the feelings of the electorate. Just you and I and others here okay. who are members of this institution, do you think it would work better yes, if we had 16 rather than 22? Absolutely. And, and I'll tell you why. I mean, there's several reasons. I think that, for starters, uh, it has been a half a century since we've really looked at the committee process in a bicameral way. And one of the things that I would like to see is a greater degree of parallelism. I know that we're often frustrated when we have several committees of jurisdiction that will go to a conference in the House and maybe one or two in the Senate. So uh, there are many things that I believe need to be addressed and I believe, you know, you ask us to divorce ourselves from this issue of the, the court of public opinion. And uh, frankly, I know that representative government says that we're not simply to be a weather vane here responding to the whim of uh, every survey that comes out. But at the same time, I know that you find it and I find it. The American people elect us every two years to come here and serve as their representative. Many of them are extremely frustrated. And they look at the committee process, they look at the overlapping, they look at the problems, they see it on C-SPAN. Uh, they know that we need to make some changes no, I accept here. all that. And, I know that. I'm just so, simply asking you as a member of this House yeah, if you I think, think we'd I work better. I think that major reform of the committee process would greatly enhance our ability to uh, be more representative. Mm -hmm. Tony, let me sure. make an observation. Your, your first observation was the limitations of reform. <laughs> Nobody's more aware of that than uh, Dave and I are, I think. Mm -hmm. we, we know that the, the political will is the essential thing that uh, runs an institution, and you can change the boxes around all you want to, but uh, unless you have political will to achieve something, you don't, you don't get it. However, I don't consider that an argument against reform you can still make improvements with regard to structure and organization that can make the institution work better. And I think that's what we've tried to do. Secondly, the point you made about the uh, scheduling and only uh, a relatively uh, small percentage of the members taking the full burden. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time on this problem of scheduling. And frankly, this, uh, I, I think scheduling is largely a prerogative of the leadership. but. My own view is that this institution isn't going to work a lot better unless you go to a four-day week. Uh, we, we really work a three-day week most of the time now. Members rebel against the idea of voting on Monday. They rebel against the idea of voting on Friday. Uh, and we accept it as we get farther along in the, the calendar and the agenda becomes more crowded. The real question in my mind is how you get members here four days a week. Uh, I, I'm for that. But uh, early in the year, it's probably not achievable because the committees aren't reporting out. But uh, I personally would take the view that the leadership ought to do everything they can to keep us here four days a week. Uh, and uh, you would not see these crazy schedules that occur on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday that way. And the institution would work somewhat better, I believe. Um, but scheduling is probably an issue that has to be thrashed out on the floor. We all have our personal views on it, and uh, uh, the leadership has to retain some uh, prerogative there. Now, on the question of committee jurisdiction, uh, I made a judgment here, and others made a judgment, and David and I disagree on this. And uh, it, it, is, it was my judgment that if you get into the business of making major change in the committee jurisdiction in this institution, you blow apart reform. Now, that may or may not be the right judgment, but it is my judgment, and it is not a judgment that I lightly come to, because my instinct is to support reform of committee jurisdiction. I don't think any person in this institution would draw committee jurisdiction as it exists today if they proceeded, as you said in your question, de novo. We all would make changes in the committee jurisdiction. But let me tell you, you're talking about power. 
You're talking about a member's power. What do you do with a member of a committee that has served on that committee for 25 years and you abolish the committee? What do you do with it? And you're not talking about one or two or three members. You're talking about a lot of members. Uh, so this is a formidable uh, problem, this committee jurisdiction problem. And I might just say historically, it has in fact blown apart congressional reform efforts when tried. If I could just uh, respond quickly to that, Tony, and that is I, I acknowledge, and we've, we've all said, there are going to be people who are offended with the prospect of major committee reform. And there are a lot of people who were friends of mine a year and a half ago who are not too pleased with me today because I've said that. But uh, we have got 114 new members of the House of Representatives. And uh, based on the number of retirements announced so far, we have going into the 104th Congress the prospect of another huge class of freshman members. And it seems to me that if we're going to find a time when we're going to step on fewer toes and offend fewer people, this is that time. And that's why I think we've got a responsibility now to put it together. It was not easy to, to, uh, to put together this bipartisan, bicameral effort. I mean, our committee put together during calendar year 1993 the largest compilation ever garnered on the institution of the Congress. And I think we have a responsibility to act on that. Mr. Chairman, um, may I have a little more time? Sure. Thank we you. OK, just, just a couple questions. One quick one, if I may, to, to Mr. Hamilton. Um, one of the things our Republican friends feel most strongly about that was not included in this was the abolition of proxy voting. I take it that was basically decided along party lines. Is there, is there a good argument, if I may put you on the spot, against abolishing it? Well, uh, this is a difficult issue. And uh, I am not at all unsympathetic to the argument that Dave Dreyer makes. I think many members are concerned that an outright ban on proxy voting will, uh, will make it more difficult to get legislation out and uh, to report legislation, contribute to, to gridlock. I personally am prepared to support an, an adjustment on the proxy voting. The Republicans, of course, want to ban it completely, as, and that happens in a number of committees here today. Uh, I think it is a matter of intense interest by a number of our committee chairmen on the Democratic side. Very intense interest and very intense uh, opposition uh, to it. Uh, but I am willing to work with you and uh, this committee and with Mr. Dreyer to making adjustments on the proxy voting because I think uh, there is merit, some merit to what he uh, has to say and maybe substantial merit. One of the biggest problems we all face, any, anyone who's ever served as a chairman knows this very well, is that of getting members to come to committee hearings. And obviously, you didn't have proxies, they might well be more inclined to come, especially if, uh, as I think you proposed, that the, the votes and the attendance of those committee hearings was to be published. Yeah, one thing we looked at very hard was to uh, permit the uh, proxy voting on the uh, final vote in a, in a committee, a motion to report legislation to the floor, abolishing the proxy vote there. That's a halfway step or a quarter of a way step that uh, would be uh, moving in the direction that uh, Dave has advocated, but not doesn't go all the way, obviously. Tony, we had uh, we had three amendments that were offered in the committee on the issue of proxy voting. As Lee said, there was the full ban, the ban in the full committee, and then a ban on simply the motion to report. All three of those amendments <coughs> died on a 6-6 party line vote. Uh, One, Mr. Dreyer, my recollection is quite different there. I, I. I do not think we had a vote on uh, the uh, all three that you mentioned. I th my recollection is we voted on only one. Well, let's check the record on that. Yeah, any, I mean, well, it, it was that Sunday afternoon, and I, I know that we offered all three of them. <laughs> Actually, Jerry May. Yeah. Yeah. I have to correct you because in votes 11, 11A, and 11B, uh, there were three individual votes that uh, failed on a 6-6 okay. six, six okay. tie. Yeah. yeah, but they're not the ones he mentioned, are they? Ban of proxy voting to insert an appropriate place in Title I a new section to ban proxy voting in committees and subcommittees. That's number one. Second vote came on a ban on proxy voting in full committee. Uh, and the third one was a ban on proxy voting if, changes, uh, if it changes the outcome of the vote. 
by Mr. Emerson. So all three failed. Yeah, we, but those, had, those are not the three that he mentioned a moment ago. Okay, we had That's three votes the in the committee on that. Uh, one. I think you both are correct. <laughs> If I may, Mr. Chairman, one final issue, which perhaps I should have spoken about first, because I personally feel perhaps this is the most important one. That's the question of scheduling. In fact, we only have a two-day scheduling. scheduling. In fact, we only have a two-day schedule these days. People come in around noon on Tuesday. We have Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday, and Thursday morning, sometimes Thursday afternoon. Again, as anyone who has served uh, as chairman of a committee around here knows, uh, you're really only successful in getting a, number of, a decent number of members to your committee on Wednesday. That's, we really have a one-day session around here so far as committee work is concerned. And again, committee work is the is core, is the basis of most legislative uh, work, or at least it ought to be. People come in here uh, around noon or early afternoon on Tuesdays. There are no votes usually until later in the afternoon on Tuesdays. Members go back to their offices. They check their phones. Uh, they look at their mail because they've been home over the weekend. Uh, they, they come over to the floor for a couple of votes late Tuesday afternoon, get them on the floor and in committee both. So there's a... There's a uh, problem there of competition between the two needs for members attention throughout the day on Wednesday Thursday morning members are, are impatient to leave have their uh, have their uh, airplane tickets in their pockets because a great majority of them fly home on, when, on Thursday afternoon if they possibly can it's hard to get them to committees on Thursday morning sometimes for a short while so you really have a two-day week at at best it's been this member's opinion that uh, we could solve a lot of our problems not all because you should need you, we do need restructuring things of that sort which we may not get uh, by requiring members to be here four or five days a week. If, you, if you're here five days a week or four, as you all suggest, you use the first day to settle in, look around your office, catch up on whatever it is that you haven't done, then there's nothing else left to do in your office. So you start looking, you start doing, looking for something to do. You go to committee meetings, which is where you're supposed to be anyway, and you come to the floor, obviously, for, for votes. But that way you can get some work done on a committee for two or three days a week. We do not do adequate committee work around here. <coughs> We don't do adequate oversight. I mean, we don't do one-third the work in, com in most committees around here that we used to do in the state legislature. But we met day after day, five days a week, and every member of every committee knew all the agencies and all the, and all the departments that were under his or her uh, jurisdiction, his or her committees, and knew the agency heads, knew which programs were working, which weren't, who you could believe, who you couldn't in terms of testimony from the legislative, from the executive branch. We have very few members here these days who have that kind of expertise over the areas in which you know, which they have um, responsibility. We've, got to, we've simply got to do something about that. So my question to you is, you've proposed something that you call a four-day legislative week. Are you talking about four full days? You're talking about two full days and two half days? And how would you enforce it? And would you, if you had your druthers, uh, require us uh, to be here maybe five days a week for, for three weeks out of four? Well, we had a large number of proposals to us with regard to scheduling, and members take a very intense uh, interest in it. I, I concur, Tony, with all that you've said. Uh, I Lee, there is no way we will uh, ever do our work around here if we continue with, with two or two I, and a half I day absolutely weeks. Absolutely. There is no that. way now, you can make uh, every reform in the world. I agree that the scheduling in a four day week at least is absolutely essential to making this place work better. The question becomes how do you get it done? Members are not going to be here unless there are votes. They will not come for a committee meeting. Uh, votes on the floor. Recorded votes on the floor. Now, one of the proposals we make is that committee votes be, matter, uh, be recorded and right. made public. I think that would be a strong inducement to get members here. If I, as chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, set a hearing on Monday, I just, or, uh, or a meeting on Monday, I get an avalanche of requests not to meet because members don't want to be here. It's become impossible for me or I think most any other committee chairman to set a meeting on Monday or Friday. Uh, so what do you do? Well, you, you have to try to accelerate the flow of legislation to the floor. Maybe you're going to have to have pro forma votes out there and uh, if you record votes in the committee and have committees meeting Monday through Thursday, or Monday, as you say, Monday through Friday, we'll get members here. But unless you put them on the record uh, with roll call votes, they will not be here. Okay, there are any number of ways of doing this, and I'll quit, Mr. Chairman, I spent too long, but the leadership wants people to be here. There are any number of ways to ensure that they are here, including removing them from committees which they don't show up for. Any number of ways. Having votes which are published. I mean, you know, did you look seriously at this three weeks on, one week off that the Senate is trying? 
We did look at that, and uh, there's just tremendous difference as to whether that's the way to proceed or not. And my own judgment on it is it's a very personal matter, three weeks uh, on, one off, or uh, the proposal the Democratic Study Group made, which is to alternate four-day weekends. Uh, I'm not sure which is the best. It really doesn't matter to me personally that much, but the four-day week does matter a lot. I think that's the core of a lot of the difference. I, my own view, Tony, on that is we should vote on it on the floor. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Well, preface my remarks by saying get rid of proxy voting and you'll solve all those problems. Your members will be here and they'll be recorded because those votes will become public knowledge. So that takes care of that. Now, having said that, uh, I've already uh, spoken uh, about my admiration and respect for both of you gentlemen and for the work that, uh, that you've done, so I won't, I, won't, <coughs> I won't repeat that. Let me just... Uh, make a couple of observations on uh, statements that both of you have made. My good friend Lee Hamilton said, quote, what do you do with a member who has chaired a committee for 25 years? Well, you know, it's happening all over America, in business and industry, in order to succeed. Big industries like GE and IBM are having to tighten their belt, and they are taking these chairmen who have chaired these, these committees or headed up these divisions or these uh, 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 bureaus, and, and, they're, and they're not there anymore because, Lee, as you said, times are changing, and you have to change with the times. My good friend Tony Bielenson, who I have great respect for, too, said to Dave Dreyer, let's put aside what the, what the electric might feel or want out there. And what do we do to, to better this institution to make it work? Well, you know, you don't really have to put those aside because really they, they go together. The American people want this system to work. You have to go back to the very beginning of why this committee was formed. And it was formed because the Republican and Democratic leadership got together to try to stop the backbiting, to try to, try to uh, uh, stop the gridlock that was taking place in this body, both between Republicans and Democrats, and between Democrats and Democrats and Republicans and Republicans, because the system just isn't working. Now, Lee, you made a, uh, uh, a very correct statement when you said that if this bill is enacted in its present form, that it will make significant changes, and, and it does. And, uh, Again, I commend all of you, and I commend myself being a part of, uh, of having, having put that together. That's a correct statement, and they are meaningful changes, but for the most part, those changes do not greatly improve the legislative process, which is the real reason that we were formed to make this system work. For example, you know, bringing Congress under some of the laws, but not all of the laws, which I object to, uh, is a significant change that, that should be made it has absolutely nothing to do with the, with the legislative process. Uh, that's why when you look at the 10 amendments that were successfully enacted and put into the bill on a bipartisan basis, they're all good changes. But then you look at the 28 amendments that were turned down. And these 28 amendments, just to, to mention just uh, four or five of them, uh, overhaul committee jurisdictions and eliminate such phantom legislative devices as proxy voting and one-third quorums and, and rolling quorums. Now, we, we just didn't deal with that. To require committee meetings to be public in the same way that hearings are, to make it more difficult to waive such House rules as a Budget Act, and when you look at how many times this Rules Committee has waived the Budget Act, and you wonder why we have these these huge deficits, uh, a three-day layover requirement so that members can know what is in the legislation. And you know, you could go on and on and on. But the problem that I see and, and the questions that I, we need to have answered here is, Lee, you, you also said you wanted full consideration of the major alternatives. And you know, that's commendable, and I, I know you mean it. And, but the problem is when we read in the press that uh, there are not going to be uh, these major alternatives allowed to deal with these issues that we've just mentioned that you both have spoken about, that Tony Bielenson spoke about, uh, 
we're, it looks like from reports in the press that we are going to be allowed one Republican alternative to this report and one Democrat alternative. And it's going to end up in a partisan vote on both sides, the same as it was on the very first day when we convened this 103rd Congress. And the rules changes went down on a party line vote. Now, I, what I would like to know from you and get a commitment from you, and with what you said in the closing statements of, the, uh, of, uh, of our joint committee, was that you wanted the House to be able to work its will. You wanted to have these debates on the floor, such things as Tony Bielenson and Jennifer Dunn, who is a Republican from Oregon, uh, wanted uh, Washington. Uh, from Washington. Beg your pardon. Uh, they want this uh, this full work week. Others don't think it'll work, but that ought to be debated, and it shouldn't have to be in a Republican alternative or a Democrat alternative. It ought to be freestanding on the floor of the House. And I guess what we need from you is. Uh, a commitment that you will uh, convince Joe Moakley and the, uh, the other members of this Rules Committee that they will give us at least the, the amendments that were turned down. I know there's a problem with opening up uh, on, a, on a completely open rule and then you get into to very controversial issues that members might not want to deal with. And that's understandable. I realize we may not be able to go that far. But there is nothing dilatory. There is nothing that is going to affect the individual member in these 28 amendments. So at least let's have an open rule to that extent so that these members can be heard. How do you feel about that? Uh, I think you raise a, a critically important question. And uh, my own personal view is that all the major alternatives to reform should be voted on on the floor. Now. Uh, I, I personally support a generous rule. I can't be more specific than that, uh, Jerry. I, 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 no, but I understand that. I believe these reform proposals are so sensitive and members look at them so personally uh, that you really ought to let them vote on the major proposals. Now, I think your observation is also correct that you cannot have a completely open rule here. We, we would be here until next year uh, voting on amendments. and. Uh, so you do have to structure it. But that's my personal view. Now, Mr. Moakley and the leadership has to weigh this uh, clearly. But uh, Mr. Moakley knows my, view, my views on it. And uh, the speaker knows my views. The majority leader knows my views on it. And I will push for that. And I'll do what I can to see that that comes about. For the record, I should say that I agree with Mr. Hamilton that we should have a reasonably open rule on this. Now, the, the, the other point I want to make on your, your, your comments about committee jurisdiction, I, I want to be clear. I believe this institution needs committee jurisdictional reform. I support that. The question is, how do you change committee jurisdictions? You've got two choices. Maybe three, I don't know, but at least two. The first choice is to come in with a plan in which you reduce the jurisdiction of the Ways and Means Committee and reduce the jurisdiction of the Energy and Commerce Committee and abolish the uh, Post Office <laughs> Committee and abolish the Merchant Marine Committee and uh, do the things that an academic would do if he were drawing a chart on the wall at the uh, Indiana University. That's one choice. My view is that if you do that, you blow this institution apart. You have blood all over the floor. You have political infighting like you'd never see. And this institution would be a long time recovering from it. I have some experience in this. I went through the Bowling Commission report. We tackled the problem head on on committee jurisdiction. And we had blood all over the Democratic caucus floor, not, as I recall, not just the uh, the whole institution. Okay, what's your other choice? We have put this proposal together on the incentives idea. Uh, I think if you put that into place over time, it would reduce and realign the committee jurisdiction, reduce the number of committees and realign the committee jurisdictions in this institution. If you make the rules tough and you enforce the rules. It has the advantage that I think you would avoid the kind of political infighting that would occur under the former proposal that I mentioned. And it has the advantage that it is flexible. It may not be as quick 
that may be a disadvantage in bringing about uh, change, but it would bring about change over time, I believe, and that's why I think it's the way to go on the question of committee jurisdiction. <clears throat> well, Lee, I, I certainly appreciate uh, that position. Uh, hopefully we are going to have uh, a rule, and again, <clears throat> we don't like to concede <clears throat> the fact that we would settle for anything less than an open rule, but uh, uh, you have to have political reality, and uh, if we could um, at least have a rule that would make in order these amendments, which everyone knows, uh, there's nothing hidden there, uh, the House could certainly work its will, and uh, and we would we would we would concede and uh, and compromise to that. Uh, <clears throat> it's my opinion that, uh, and I served on the uh, on the Patterson um, uh, Joint Committee, if you recall, uh, back in 1979, and uh, we did what you said. We took a bill to the floor. Uh, we had these major changes, and then we got 44 votes, I think, on the floor of Congress, and uh, uh, we don't want that to happen. But if we were to go on the floor with a generous rule, as you've spoken about, uh, and the House worked its will, and we did take the drier proposal, which does co condense it down from 22 down to 16, uh, changes the jurisdictions, and let the House speak its will. You know, there are 117 new members now. By next election, more than, I think, 75% of the Congress is going to be elected after 1990. Uh, you know, those people want change, too. And uh, so, you know, the... Uh, Jerry, the let, me, let me just say, uh, I should say, Dave has put a lot of work in on that committee jurisdiction proposal. I've seen it. Yes. He's done an excellent job. He's, it makes a lot of sense in many, many respects, and I, I commend him for it uh, because it is an, it's an important alternative. Well, you, I, I thank you. Let me just say, I, I appreciate that. Uh, but that's not to say that the package that I would want to bring forward wouldn't uh, be modified slightly because I will say that there are a number of things that have come to my attention since sure. we first offered that that I think uh, warrants some modification in the plan. But thank you for that. Uh, well, Lee, again, uh, to the both of you, I appreciate your testimony, and uh, we certainly, Lee, appreciate your, your efforts to see that we do get a generous and fair rule. The key <laughs> word is fair. Thank you very much, both of you. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Both of you have done great jobs, Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Dreyer. Your dedication is unquestionably the best that I've ever known. But listening to the reform chair, there's a pro and a con always. You mentioned a four-day work week. You've got to realize that this body is a political body. And I think a lot has to do with the scheduling on the floor of the house. People feel sometimes that they need to get back to their district and do some work. <coughs> We're still a political animal. What do you do if there's no business on the floor? You hog tie, you rope, you bring them over in, in irons to keep them here. To me, that is not realistic. Be here when you're needed. Do away with proxy voting as has been testified on one side. And I think it would be helpful. We all know we need reform. There's no question about it. Differences of opinion concludes in a great reform measure. If it were all one-sided, then there would be no reform. And I'm beginning to think that reform emanates on the Democrat side of the party in this body. And that isn't fair. That isn't right. The Republican Party has been kicked around, and we have good ideas. Look at the composition on the Rules Committee. Four Republicans and nine Democrats. I haven't heard you testify as to committee composition. I haven't heard you testify on the things that make the Congress work in a better form and a better fashion. You can't pin it down on work days. You can't pin it down on 
uh, proxy voting. Yes, I know what proxy voting is. We don't have it on this committee, but I served two years on the public works. Usually they call you at home, can we have your proxy to vote a certain way in committee? There's, the legislation reported oftentimes doesn't have a consensus. And if they, if you were to eliminate proxy voting, you'd have better legislation which would hit the floor and would not be so controversial. But be that as it may, uh, one party outlook is not the other party's outlook. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we let the Democrat National Committee and the Republican National Committee carry on the politics of this nation? instead of it being on the floor of the House, instead of everything being political, what do we think of the people? What they want, instead of what the party want. This body represents the people and our founding fathers. And the Federalist paper says the House of Representatives should be the closest to the people. It doesn't mean that the Democrat Party is closer to the people than the Republican Party. And any reform measure that hits the floor shouldn't be one-sided, and I don't think you all are. <coughs> but to me, reform is necessary in this body, but the m number of things haven't been touched, in my opinion. <coughs> and I would hope that the base could be broadened. I would hope that the, the uh, measure could be brought to the floor without the controversy that obviously is going to be on the measure as you all have explained it. So I'm not here just to being critical. There are many good thoughts emanating from your report. <coughs> but really now, Lee, isn't it political? David, do you feel like that these reform measures carry a Republican thought or in majority a Democrat thought? Well, the structure of the committee, Mr. Quillen, was clearly to be uh, bipartisan. But what happened to us, um, until it came to reporting the measure out, which I agreed to do so, frankly, we could come before our rules committee um, and move the process forward, the 28 amendments to which Mr. Solomon referred were defeated on a 6-6 tie. So uh, unfortunately, while the goal was bipartisan, we weren't able to report the measure out unless we had the support of, uh, of a Democrat. And uh, they, I mean, the, the amendments that were unfortunately defeated. So that made it uh, clearly, and, and one of the things we haven't really touched on here is we worked hard to try and assemble what we call the chairman's mark. And the chairman's mark was the vehicle that we used. Well, the fact of the matter is, the chairman's mark, the way it was structured, basically ended up, with the exception of those uh, 10 or so amendments that were offered, uh, what we have. And that, I, I did not draft that chairman's mark. And I would have preferred to see the chairman's mark, the vehicle that we utilized, uh, in a much different form than it was. So clearly the chairman's mark did come from the majority. Mr. Hamilton. Uh, Mr. Quillen, I think you made several very good points. Um, you, one, one point you made was that there are many things not addressed in this package. You're dead right about that. Um, we, we had thousands of suggestions made, and we obviously uh, picked uh, what we thought were the more important areas, and I'm sure our judgment's not flawless there. There are many, many important things not included in this package. I'd have to acknowledge that. And uh, uh, I hope that as the process moves forward, uh, the things we omitted and missed uh, will be considered. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, the, the bill that I have introduced with the recommendations are all recommendations that came out with bipartisan support. They could not have come out strictly with a Democratic vote or strictly with a Republican vote. The Democrats accepted, don't hold me precisely to these numbers, I think we accepted about eight Republican amendments and rejected about uh, 20, 25 maybe. I'm not sure of the exact number. 
the Democrats offered about uh, 15 amendments, and the Republicans, or at least some Republicans, supported those amendments that are incorporated in the bill that I've introduced. So every proposal in the bill has some bipartisan support. Uh, otherwise, it would not have come out. Uh, but on, I should on, say, I did, not yeah. I did not play a role in putting that chairman's mark together, and there were many things no. that I wanted to see in the chairman's mark that unfortunately no, weren't there. Mr. Dreyer is correct about that. Um, on the proxy voting, I've commented on that. I, I, I want to keep an open mind with you on it. It is not in this uh, proposal. Something probably should be in the proposal with regard to proxy voting. And finally, your, your initial point about the importance of letting members be back in their districts, I think all of us would accept. I, but however you structure the scheduling, Mr. Bielenson and I were talking about that a moment ago, however you structure it, you have to allow time for members to spend a lot of time in their uh, congressional districts, that's for sure. Well, I, I've been under the impression in <clears throat> the 31 years that I've been here that the scheduling on the floor is done by the speaker. That's right. And I don't know what reform you have to curtail or improve the speaker's scheduling authority. Is there anything in this measure to, that would do that? Well, we have some recommendations with regard to scheduling, uh, but we recognize that, uh, there are many, many different opinions in this body with respect to, to scheduling. And as I've indicated, I think it really is going to have to be resolved on the floor with a vote of some kind. Do you want to go to a three weeks on, one week off system, or do you want to go to the DSG proposal, which is alternating four-day weekends? Uh, and, and there are probably other proposals. In the end, the speaker is going to insist on substantial prerogatives of scheduling. That's one of the prerogatives of the leadership. But I think he, I've, uh, look, I, I have found the speaker and the majority leader uh, intensely interested in how to accommodate members on scheduling. Uh, the problem is uh, uh, how to do it. <laughs> it's just a formidable task because we all operate on, on different uh, uh, schedules and there are enormous geographic differences. The West Coast fellow looks at this very differently than someone from uh, the East Coast. I certainly offer no criticism <laughs> to any speaker I've served under. All have been honorable, especially the one we have now. But I've always found when, like the winding up last year, that the members don't have a fair shot at, at what they're going to shoot at, so to speak, keep us around the clock when measures could be scheduled long before, and we're going to have a recess next week honoring one of our great presidents. And here we go, scheduling a controversial bill on the floor today. We're waiting for the Senate to act. There's nothing ever certain. And I don't know what a four-day week would accomplish when you have the speaker doing your scheduling, and I think he should retain that. But again, I say, wouldn't it be wonderful, instead of getting on the floor and having a partisan attitude but everything we do, this goes both with Democrats and the Republicans. And we march up the aisle as uh, Americans, thinking of our people, not thinking who's going to be elected president next time, not thinking of politics, but getting down to the business and cure the ills of this House and this Congress. No, we haven't addressed that. And it is a political animal, all of us are. And I don't know how to contain it. I don't know how to, to govern it at all. But that's the way this body is. That's the way it was created to begin with, and it'll always be that. Yeah. I want to commend both of you again. Lee Hamilton, I know you're sincere. I don't question that one bit. And David Dreyer, you are. I know you're sincere, and I don't question that one bit. But you're down there now, not here in this chair. 
but I'm I much have... more comfortable up there, I should say, Mr. Chairman. Well, no. I'll see next to you. Back <laughs> yeah, I'll be back. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A lot has been said, and you all have been here quite a while, but I'd like to add uh, my congratulations for your product. I realize it wasn't easy, and I know uh, just from the schedule of watching uh, how many long hours you put in, and I agree, there's not a member of Congress who doesn't have a very strong view uh, on some aspect of this particular uh, subject, uh, and to have had to sit there and digest them all and screen them out and come up with a product that uh, even has a chance of going forward uh, seems to me to be an achievement of some merit, and I congratulate you for that. Mr. Dreyer, I note you voted for the uh, passage of this, uh, even though you've made a statement that uh, you didn't support it. I, I presume what we've got is that you're for reform, but not this reform, because there's not quite enough of it. Is that accurate? That, that, that's uh, <coughs> basically what happened, Porter. I anguished over that, uh, that final vote uh, on the issue, and, and uh, members uh, on our side on the Joint Committee, <coughs> and I sat down, and uh, I concluded that, that uh, we could have killed the process of reform in the joint committee, and it would have ended there. If I had voted no, we would not have, it would have died on a 6-6 vote, the way our Republican amendments died uh, in the committee. But I came to the conclusion that uh, we should keep the process going forward. Uh, I always say that uh, as a minority member here, uh, I'm the eternal optimist, uh, always looking for the silver lining in the dark cloud. Uh, I could have voted against it because, as I said in my statement, Porter, I'm, I'm very unhappy with, uh, with the product, and I'm not at this point co-sponsoring it. I, I should say that, uh, and I've, I've said this to, uh, to those in the media, that if we did have a commitment for a generous rule that it would allow all of those items to be um, uh, considered on the House floor, I would co-sponsor the legislation at that moment because I think that this is our one opportunity. As I was saying earlier, with all these new members of Congress, with the changes that are taking place here, the desire for reform, I think this is the time to do it. Uh, so that's the reason that I felt that if I had cast uh, a no vote that I really would have uh, brought the process to an end. I should say that Mr. Emerson also voted in favor of it. So. Uh, it was reported out by a two-vote margin. Uh, I, I ask the point because a lot has been said here about what's been done, and a lot has been said about what's been left undone. And I, uh, you know, if you add it all up on a sheet, there's a whole lot that's left, uh, and what's done is a lot smaller. And that's inevitable because we've got at least 435 members here and 100 on the other side. Uh, so that's a whole lot of ideas. My concern is your observation with which I agree that now is the right time. And, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I ask you this with all respect. We've got 110 or so uh, freshmen who came in in this class, and uh, we're probably going to have a few more. And there's an attitude of uh, a few running everything and the great vast majority running nothing and just being here at the will uh, of the few leaders, uh, the uh, powerful uh, uh, chairman of the committees, uh, and to, I suppose, a minor extent to some of the ranking members. But uh, the, the concern is that pretty soon that we are going to have, uh, if we don't already, uh, a critical mass that is going to bring reform. Wouldn't it be better to do it in an orderly way? Uh, you spoke very eloquently of personal considerations of every member, and I think that's a valid point. But I think I speak for a great many of the new members, of which I am one, that are more concerned about institutional reform than the opportunity for personal advance in the institution. Obviously, at my age in a minority party, uh, I am not uh, anticipating a chairmanship role uh, any any uh, any time in a normal lifespan, shall we put it that way. Wait, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe next year. Maybe next year. Well, we'll see. That's, uh, that's the first right good news right I've right had on that. Right after I share this. I hope you're going to live longer than that. <laughs> I'm certainly going to get a, co a copy of this testimony. I want to be sure. It's the first good light I've seen. Um, but the, I think that that's a very valid point, that um, there are two things we've talked about, and they're confused. You've got this critical mass calling for reform and, and a degree of expectancy across our land on, you know, change or breaking gridlock. You can put it any way you want. 
I, I hope that we don't break gridlock at the expense of deliberation, because deliberation is the essence of good legislation, but uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, my concern is that we've somehow sent a message that we're going to have this reform. Most of this reform is organizational, structural type, although there were some sort of perks and privileges areas of reform, not much. Um, it, it was more in the area of how do you make it work better, which I think is exactly appropriate because I think if you deliver a good product to America, you build respect, and I think that means a whole lot more. And I congratulate you for concentrating on that area. If I've missed, missed a point on that, let me know. The reason I am concerned is that um, there's some talk in here about an ethics committee change, uh, and, and I, I'm not sure what that's in response to. Uh, there is some talk in here about, uh, quote, public understanding of Congress. Uh, I think that's a two-edged sword, but uh, let's assume that uh, if we have a good product, we will get a good response. Uh, on, uh, on the other hand, I would hate to have that become uh, a mecca for spin doctors. Uh, it, we've already got enough spin doctors, uh, uh, I think, uh, trying to tell people what's uh, their view of happening. Uh, and my concern is we've created now this idea that we're going to have reform, but it's really an in-house, working, structural, uh, very, very technical in many ways, uh, designed to produce a better legislative process. And it is not going to the question of the bad reputation so much that the uh, institution, uh, sadly, or the lack of confidence, shall we say, that the institution sadly has with the people we serve. Uh, I'm disappointed that we don't have a work product that gets more to that issue, but I will say that I don't think that was your charge. I, I admit, you were, your charge was to come up with an organization that works better. Uh, and those are the comments I have after listening to your testimony, uh, being a little bit familiar with the content of what you've got, what you've rejected, and what you're not. But I say those uh, comments with the highest respect for the fact you've accomplished as much as you have. And any part of that you wish to respond to either of you, I'd be very happy to have your view. And then I want to ask you about the rule, and then I will be quiet. Well, well, uh, one thing I would say is, just on your last point, Porter, the issue of uh, what our charge was, in the uh, opening statement of our report, uh, we uh, state that uh, the formal adoption of the Resolution 192 created the 28-member temporary committee to make a full and complete study of the organization and operation of the Congress and to recommend improvements which would strengthen the effectiveness of the Congress, simplify its operations, improve its relationship with and oversight of other branches of the U.S. government, and improve the orderly consideration of legislation. So, I mean, it was a pretty far-reaching... Uh, if it had said, and improve its image, or enhance its image, or build the credibility with the infer, American you can people... You from it whatever you like. But well, we hope that all of those things, in fact, would lead to that, yeah, uh, I'm absolutely. assuming. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Goss, I, uh, I listened attentively to your, uh, your comments. Uh, number one, you talked about your interest in institutional reform as opposed to your personal perspective. I, I tried to say in my testimony the same thing. I think that's exactly the right perspective to bring to this uh, reform package. Not only how does it affect me as an individual member of the institution, but how does it affect the institution? And, and members really do need to focus on both of those questions. Uh, so I think I commend you for your perspective, and I hope that we have others joining you in it. Secondly, you asked, asked about the critical mass uh, on the floor, and uh, I'm aware that your comments are, are absolutely right. Uh, we did our best here in trying to reach out to people. Uh, we certainly, I certainly talked, David certainly talked with an awful lot of members of this institution, and we both learned a lot about it in the process. And we heard uh, witnesses and all the rest uh, in great number. You, it is never possible, I think, to consult with everybody to, to the extent that they'd like to be consulted with. Uh, we made an effort. We may not have made enough of an effort, but we tried. My answer to the question of the critical mass on the floor is that where you have that critical mass, you obviously have a major reform issue, and I think it ought to be voted on on the floor, period. Uh, that's, that's one way I think you will get member participation, and that's what I would support. I do want to say a word about the ethics because we haven't discussed it at all. What we said here was that 
we, we, we accept the present division in the ethics process in this institution of having fact-finding as one part of it and judgment as part of the other. And in order to try to increase uh, public confidence in the Congress and to get away with this eye from this perception that is very strong among the public uh, that uh, there's, uh, we're all scratching one another's backs around here, uh, we suggested using outside people in the fact-finding process. And um, uh, that's done for the purpose of enhancing the public's confidence in that process. Uh, other professional groups are moving in that direction, and that's the way we thought we might move as well. Now, we do that only at the discretion of the chairman and the ranking member. In other words, they've got to give an ethics case in front of them. Uh, maybe it's a minor case, they'll go ahead and handle it. Maybe it's a very, very major case and they'll decide they need some independent fact finders brought in, but it's at the discretion of the two leaders of the committee. Um, two other quick comments. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but you, you mentioned the whole business of public understanding. And I think we miss all kinds of opportunities around here uh, to provide public understanding of the institution. Uh, for example, we have millions and millions of visitors coming to the institution. They walk down the halls, look at a lot of statues, and they see some pretty rooms and recognize a few personalities, but they do not really leave this institution with a better understanding of what the constitutional role of the Congress is uh, in the country. By the way, and Lee Hamilton gives one of the best tours of those statues. I've seen him do it with classes <laughs> yeah. several times. Uh, so. But one of the things we found out, and this is the point here, that whatever you do on this business of trying to increase the public understanding of the institution is going to cost some money. It really does, putting up a visitor center or something like that. Now, there may be a lot of other suggestions out there that we ought to look at, but I'm all for that and happy to explore it. Finally, the, the point on reform. Uh, you know, if you ask members, to, or not members, but if you ask the public today, does the Congress of the, Insti uh, of the United States need reform? Uh, our constituents will tell us overwhelmingly yes. What do they mean by that? Well, I think what they mean is they want to see this institution addressing more directly the problems that concern them. They want us to be more efficient. They want us to be more effective. They want us not to spend, to be wasteful and all the rest of it. The problem here becomes that the business of reform is a technical business. I mean, you go through our recommendations here and they're very technical. Yeah. Proxy voting. Uh, scheduling, <laughs> uh, motions to recommit. These are the way this institutions work. They're very, very technical. If you go before an, uh, the American public and talk about motions to recommit and uh, some of these things, I think it's hard for them to connect uh, for understandable reasons. And I, I, I am impressed by the fact that the business of reform is a very technical business in the end. I agree entirely with your comments, and I, I think you're exactly right. It's going to be very hard to convince people that uh, these technical reforms that we make are going yeah. to be wonderful things. Uh, they may, we may know it, but they may not, and yeah. the product is what they're looking for. That's exactly right. Um, I, I appreciate what you said, and it's sort of interesting. We've been talking about this ethics idea, and I don't want to belabor it today, but we're talking about independent council legislation today, and this is a little bit like that, and in fact, there is some nexus. I don't know if you deliberated on that, but it may or may not come up during the debate today. Uh, on the rule itself, you said that you would favor a rule where we have uh, plenty of opportunity to debate the major proposals that uh, are in the bill. Uh, and Mr. Dreyer has said he would prefer uh, an open type rule or a mostly open type rule. Uh, do you think there's an area of agreement there that anything that your committee has reported out and voted out that we've got would be uh, considered uh, worthy of discussion on the floor, or is that going too Mr. far? Mr. Goss, it goes too far for me, to be frank. Okay. I, I, I think many of them should be voted on on the floor, but I don't want to say every amendment. No, I, I'm not trying to pin you down. I'm just trying to see okay. if there's a ground there. I believe the major policy issues should be voted on on the floor. I don't draw the rule. That's not going to be my task, but my, that's going to be my recommendation because I believe that's the way. Because the point you make about the critical mass is exactly right in my judgment. And you ought to give members a crack at it. Now, that's going to be a tough judgment, and uh, others will make the decision, not me, but that's my position on it. Fair enough. Mr. Dreyer, you, how about you feel about the role? Well, 
I know this comes as a great surprise, but I'd like an open rule. Uh, it seems to me that, and, and it's been my impression from the, the conversations that I've had with Lee on this issue, that you know, we've, we've got to make a determination as to what the major items that were uh, discussed in the committee are. I mean, I, I think that um, all of the areas raised in those 20 some odd amendments that were defeated should be voted on. As I've said, if it ends up that we have a, a rule that uh, only allows for one vote on proxy voting, uh, you know, I think that's, that's quite possible. But it, it does seem to me that, that we should make sure that every single uh, issue that was raised in the committee should be considered uh, on the House floor. But of course, my preference would be to have an open rule that would allow any member who would like to offer an amendment to this uh, package the right to do that. Well, I thank you. And the only final observation I'll make is I note the Rules Committee itself was the subject of some consideration for the reform, as I think it probably should be, because I think the observation is correctly made, be the nexus between the Speaker of the House and the Rules Committee uh, as an agent of the speaker, or uh, is it an agent of the members? Uh, and I don't. I guess we'll argue about that forever. Uh, I gather there's no recommendation to abolish the rules committee yet. <laughs> well, some people have recommended that, and I've been actually looking very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. We, we thank you both very much for spending a couple of hours with us here today. We have a number of other members of the uh, of the Joint Committee on Reform, and and maybe we can withhold to a certain extent. Uh, since we've all had a chance to make some comments ourselves about how we feel about the process and, and in the next uh, half hour, an hour, or whatever it might take, uh, Good job, David. get the benefit of, of getting the perspective of each of these members of, of, of the work product of their, of their uh, efforts. Mr. Obie, uh, Honorable David Obie from Wisconsin, I think is our next most senior member. It's good to have you here, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was only asking members of the Rules Committee to, to restrain themselves. You folks who come up and testify can say anything you want. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I've got about between to toxic spills and a few other things back in, in my district today, I've got more than a few other things that are distracting me, so I'm going to have to get back to the wonders of the modern chemical industry. But uh, let me turn to the subject at hand. I, I'm here to basically support the thrust of a good many of the recommendations made by this committee. I don't know of anybody in this institution who has uh, uh, dealt for a longer period of time with reform than has Mr. Hamilton. Uh, I think Jamie will remember um, uh, when I appeared before this committee in 1974 on some reform propositions out of the, a commission that I chaired. Mr. Hamilton was then a key member, in fact, the key task force chair which produced a lot of those recommendations. So he's been in this a long time trying to reform the institution. I know you have, as have a number of others. And I think the many constructive <coughs> changes, I think the Ethics Committee changes, are wise. I think that uh, uh, the necessity to focus on the difference between compensation for House staff versus Senate staff is important. I don't think many House members realize it. But if you compare the compensation for an administrative assistant, legislative director, legislative assistant, or, uh, or uh, public information uh, person or press secretary, between the Senate and the House, you will see that for doing the same work, uh, the Senate counterparts are paid anywhere between 18 and 50 percent more. And it, and, it just, and it just seems to me that uh, yeah, it's on, I think. It seems to me that uh, before, uh, uh, before, or when we analyze uh, uh, staff budgets around here, we need to start with the recognition that it would take almost $40 million just to bring uh, uh, House staffers to the same level of pay that Senate staffers get for doing the same work. Now, that's, that's uh, a remarkable gap which ought to be closed. The La Follette Commission in 46, which talked about congressional reform, talked about the need to equalize uh, that staff compensation, and since that time, the, the gap has grown. It hasn't narrowed. 
Uh, I think uh, the GNP budget analysis is an especially important uh, provision, uh, which I thoroughly support. I think including the cost of tax expenditures in the budget resolution is very important. Um, I think uh, uh, bringing Congress into closer compliance with, uh, with other federal laws, uh, while it is very technical, as Mr. Hamilton suggested, is very uh, important to try to do. There are some, uh, some uh, recommendations about which I have some concerns. Uh, and, and I will discuss uh, in another forum uh, a number of my concerns, but I'd like to focus on two of them today. One is the idea of two-year budgeting. Uh, I suppose uh, some people would characterize my concerns about that as simply reflecting the concerns uh, 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 related to the fact that I'm a member of the Appropriations Committee, but I really believe that's not the case at all. Uh, my concern is rather uh, wearing, uh, wearing another hat as chair of the Joint Economic Committee. Uh, the fact is that budgeting plays a key role in economic policy. And, and I think elected public officials, rather than non-elected bureaucrats, ought to uh, have a, a larger influence on the shape and nature of the economy. And I really believe that two-year budgeting turns government fiscal policy lock, stock, and barrel over to the Federal Reserve, and I don't see the wisdom of doing that. Uh, if, you are, if you think about the history of the economy since all of us have been here, uh, uh, just w when Jerry Ford took office, for instance, uh, his main control was to get, or his main effort was to get a handle on inflation. Whip inflation now was the focus. Just four months later, the economy started to move dramatically, and by the uh, and for the rest of that year, the problem was uh, declining unemployment. Economic conditions totally changed. If you have a two-year budget in place, you minimize the opportunity of the policy making people in this government, in both the White House and the Congress, to adjust to those economic changes. And if you try to, you invite incredible Christmas trees on appropriation supplementals. Uh, and, and given the fact that the Senate has much looser rules than we do on that score, I think you invite incredible gamesmanship, because if the economy is changing and, and you have to have an emergency uh, action uh, in, in order to deal with it, people's price for cooperation can be very high. And I, so I really would urge you to look at that, not from the standpoint of people's jurisdictional dunghills around here, to be blunt about it, but from the standpoint of what the economy needs to provide, uh, or, or I mean what we need to, to provide flexible a fiscal policy in, the, in a changing economy. I would also suggest that there is one area where I think we need to go much further. Uh, there is one recommendation in here uh, which I'm largely responsible for, uh, which allows members of the House for the first time to refer to certain actions in the Senate. Uh, strangely, under our rules, uh, we can talk about the president until the cows come home, but we cannot refer to specific legislative actions in the other body uh, without being uh, ruled out of order. So if the Senate is filibustering a piece of legislation, for instance, we can't even comment on that without being in technical violation of our own rules. I think that's wacky, and, and we have a recommendation to change it. But I think we need to go far beyond that. I would answer Mr. Goss's question about the Speaker and the Rules Committee this way. I would say that I think the Speaker is the agent of the House, and I believe that the Rules Committee is the agent of the leadership. Now, people can differ about that uh, institutionally, but that happens to be my institutional view. Um, I think that if we elect somebody to be Speaker of this House, he has to be given the tools to move this institution forward. Uh, with due respect to uh, the rights of other people in the body. Uh, but I think the principal goal of these reforms ought not to be to improve the convenience of uh, members of the Congress. I think it ought to be to improve accountability in our political system. 
And I think we do not do that unless we take a major step forward on, uh, on insisting on changes on the Senate filibuster. We could not provide those recommendations in the context of our committee deliberations, but the Rules Committee certainly has the authority to do that. And here's what I mean. Uh, and I'm not trying to be partisan about this, uh, but the fact is that the country elected a Democratic President, a Democratic Senate, a Democratic House. They have a right to expect that they can therefore hold us accountable for what does or does not happen in this body. But the problem is that the rules get in the way of, uh, of that accountability chain. What happens, uh, example, is that uh, on the President's uh, jobs package last year, I don't want to debate that, but the point is that in the Senate, uh, even though a majority was for that, we could not even get a vote on it. Um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, in the past, filibusters and the threat of filibusters used, uh, used to be used on the great constitutional or societal issues of our time, and, and I recognize the legitimacy of that. I think that any time uh, a, a constitutional amendment is involved, the Senate ought to be able to talk at great length, because our obligation, uh, our prior, uh, primary obligation, is to defend the Constitution, not to promote the agenda of a majority. But on non-constitutional questions, I deeply believe that our obligation is to see to it that a majority at least can have its proposition presented to the bodies for a vote, whether they pass or not. And I think uh, without action on the filibuster, we are pre prevented from accomplishing the primary objective of any legislative body, which is to get its work done and to get the public's agenda uh, uh, dealt with. Um, the, and to me, if we don't do something about the filibuster and its little brother, the anonymous Senate hold, we will never really uh, have an accountable uh, legislative body. Uh, the uh, uh, House members routinely, when we fashion legislation, discuss how we have to tailor the bill to avoid a Senate filibuster. And so it just seems to me that this pro uh, the, the proposal before you today has a lot of provisions to expand minority rights. And with one exception, I largely agree with them. I also would go further in one respect. I do believe something needs to be done on proxy voting. I'm not sure where you draw the line, but I've always favored some kind of change in proxy voting. Uh, in the Appropriations Committee, we don't have it. I recognize that other committees have different problems and they may need it in circum certain circumstances, but I do believe some additional change ought to be made. But I believe that in order to get a balanced package, that there ought to be a linkage clearly created in people's minds between the expansion of uh, the rights or convenience of a parliamentary minority and and uh, the, the recognition of the needs of a parliamentary majority to at least get a vote on, on uh, its propositions. The recommittal uh, motion in this package is, des is designed to enhance the right of the minority to get a vote. It seems to me that concurrent with that, we have an obligation to enhance the ability of a majority to get a vote. And I believe that the House itself is unfairly discredited in the public's mind when we pass bill after bill after bill and then it is held up um, in the Senate because of the filibuster. Now, when you get into something as mundane as grazing fees on a filibuster, it reminds me of the play A Man for All Seasons when Sir Thomas More had been betrayed by Richard Rich and uh, uh, more uh, turn, and Rich had been promised uh, that he could run Wales in return for selling out Sir Thomas More. And so when Moore found out about it, he said, Richard, I can understand you're, you're betraying me for England, but for Wales? Yeah. And it just seems to me that, that we are allowing people to, in an essence, betray the obligation we have to, 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 to uh, provide uh, for uh, uh, legitimate actions of governance when we allow a willful minority in the other body 
to prevent us from even getting a vote. Now, I want to see most of these minority rights expansions in this House passed because I think that most of them, as I say with one exception, are rational and just. But I think we have an obligation to ourselves as stewards of the public interest to see to it that we also uh, uh, break through the ability of willful minorities to bring these institutions to a halt. And that's what they do when they use a device like the filibuster. And so I would urge you uh, to simply add to this a proposition which says that most of these proposals can go forward. But with respect to the expansion of minority rights, that those will go forward only when the Rules Committee reports to the House that the Senate has uh, uh, rules which allow a majority to obtain uh, a vote on uh, uh, a proposition which is supported by a majority. Uh, and I'm not suggesting it has, to, it has to happen immediately. But over time, you ought to be able to get to a vote. And, and I think if we do that, we will have uh, done something that is truly important to breaking gridlock around here, which I think is what the public elected us to try to do. Thank you very much. Just one quick question as a matter of curiosity. What, what's the, the one proposal with respect to minority rights that you yourself don't, don't particularly favor? Uh, guaranteeing the minority a right to recommit with instructions, I think, is not always legitimate. I think we have to remember that the, the recommittal motion is largely a leftover from the days when we did not have votes in the, the Committee of the Whole. And so uh, uh, I think you ought to look at that, and there ought to be modifications so that you say, uh, and this is just rough, uh, it has to be refined, but so that you can say um, in cases where the minority has not been given the right to offer a significant amendment, in other words, a closed rule. Perhaps then they can offer a, a, a recommittal motion with instructions. But in cases where the Rules Committee has already given the minority a right to a major uh, to a major amendment, it seems to me that there's no obligation to give them two kicks at the cat when the majority is getting one. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Obi, Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Obi, good afternoon. I. Uh, I think that there probably is some very philosophical, significant philosophical space between your view of the institution and mine, and I think that's what makes it a great institution. I suspect if we got all 435 of us, we would find there's lots of disagreement on a lot of things. One of the things we are concerned about on the minority, and I have to make the point, is that it is true, as you say, that we have a Democrat-controlled House, and a Democrat-controlled Senate, and a Democrat-controlled White House. But that does not mean that there are not any Republicans or Independents or others out there in America who need good governance and good representation. And the issue of balancing that out in this deliberative body seems to me to be the essence of the charge our Founding Fathers gave us in the way they set it up. You speak of the Speaker having to have control of the Rules Committee, in effect, the Rules Committee being an agent of the Speaker, if the Speaker is an agent of the House, uh, in order to accomplish the will of the Speaker to bring the agenda forward. And I think your exact words were to move the institution forward. And I have no quarrel at all with that, as long as we agree on what is moving the institution forward. And that's where we disagree. Many of the things we think are good for the, inf uh, the institution and for America uh, are not in sync with what others, the speaker, you, perhaps, you and I would agree on some of, disagree on some of that. And I think that's why we have a deliberative process. I don't want that process to become so streamlined, so lopsided, so carved, so uh, premeditated that there is no room for a legitimate change of view as we go along, a little bit, a, departure from a preordained program that, uh, in fact, may be a departure that is an improvement in the program. Uh, I think that is exactly the kind of um, guarantee we need to provide for all Americans is that there will be a consideration of good ideas uh, and that nobody, no party or no individual, has a monopoly on good ideas or on bad ideas. And I think that's the, the beauty of the system we use. Well, I don't disagree with that, uh, I would, but, but I would simply say that uh, I don't think, with all due respect to your concerns, I don't think the Speaker 
in this house is an especially powerful institution. Uh, I mean, I, I came from a legislature uh, which, during the years in which I served, had a speaker who appointed every member to committees, not just of the majority party, but the minority party. So I was running the Joint Finance Committee and running the budgets uh, one year, and the next year I had the last slot in the Public Works Committee. Uh, that's real power in the hands of the speaker. Uh, I, I, I think the problem... Uh, Speaker, uh, I, I, I think the problem in this place is often uh, that, that uh, the Speaker's powers are in fact uh, uh, much more limited uh, not only uh, officially by the rules but culturally uh, in comparison to what they were a number of years ago and I don't think the institution is, uh, is better for it. I think the Speaker's powers needs to be enhanced, uh, his powers need to be enhanced and then I think he needs to be held accountable for his use of those bonds. Well, I, I understand what you're saying. I think you've just described the President of the United States, and I, I, I think that's part of the problem. We can only have one President at a time, but I will point out, of course, historically, and you would know this better than I, because I'm a newcomer, and I, I know that you know a good deal more about the institution than I do, the pendulum does swing on the question of the Speaker's power, and I, I know back uh, when, when Mr. Cannon was here and there was some talk about how things were going to get changed, things got changed because there was sort of a rebellion. Uh, maybe it's time that the, the pendulum go back. I think everybody, in a way, is looking for more discipline and more guidance. I think a lot of the testimony we have heard and more we're going to hear is that the working Wednesday Congress isn't doing it. We've got to do more and we've got to do it better. Uh, and I think that we're all trying to get to that goal and whatever uh, recommendations there are to either enhance or diminish the speaker's role in that I think are valid. This is the time to be discussing those things. So I think you've hit a good point and I thank you for it. Thank you. And we thank you for your testimony, sir. Thank you much. Next up is uh, Mr. Robert Walker, gentleman from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have some prepared remarks I'd ask you to consent. That objection, they'll be record. introduced in the record at this point. I'll summarize those, and I want to make a couple okay, of other uh, comments. Um, first of all, uh, I do hope that we will be able to have as open a rule as possible out of this committee. It seems to me that it would be useful for the House to work its will on matters that affect all members of the House. Uh, I must say that there are some things within this proposal that I think are useful. I think that the uh, fact that we did suggest that an accurate congressional record uh, ought to be uh, the uh, way in which we operate is something that is down in this proposal that uh, makes some sense. Uh, I think that some of the things that we did on the budget uh, are important. Uh, I would uh, be 180 degrees different from Dave Obey on the question of uh, biannual budgeting. I think that's one of the most important reforms within this uh, uh, particular document. and. Uh, I would hope that this committee uh, goes along with what the Reform Committee suggested in the area of biannual budgeting. That's not to say that we manage to do everything that needs to be done in budget reform. There are several things that were left undone uh, that the uh, House ought to be able to act on and uh, I would hope that we will be given a chance to act on uh, in the course of the deliberations on the floor. Uh, in fact, uh, there are some things uh, that uh, uh, were uh, rejected with a 6-6 vote in the subcommittee uh, that represented real reform in budgeting in other areas that certainly ought to be brought to the House floor. It seems to me any amendment that was lost on a tie vote in a reform committee is something that ought to be given consideration in the uh, uh, full House. Uh, it, it should not be shut out uh, by some uh, restrictive rule when in fact the, the reform committee, the so-called bipartisan reform committee, uh, uh, came to a tie vote with regard to, to the issue and that the only reason why the amendments failed was because uh, of the rule of the House that suggests that any amendment fails on a tie vote. There are a number of those and it seems to me they, they need to be uh, uh, then taken up in the House as a whole. Let me interrupt you very briefly, Bob, if I may. Uh, Mr. Solomon and some others were speaking about a number of of such amendments which were offered, I guess, by Republican members of your committee. I take it there may have been some also offered by Democratic that's members, which all six Republicans voted against. Uh, that's, so, that's, that's correct. Right. And, no, and, and, I, and, and my suggestion would be that anything no, no, that I understand that. I understand that. I just want to make sure that there were, I mean, there were some that you all didn't care for that 
that our Democratic colleagues also introduced. I think, uh, I think, I think that's the case. Um, uh, I, uh, I think that the majority of the ones that were on the tie vote were probably Republican amendments. But I would uh, yeah. I, I simply suggest that anything that was done uh, by tie vote in a committee that was set up to reform the Congress, it seems to me ought to be something that's focused on by, by the full House. Uh, I hear you. Uh, I also think that uh, we, we failed to do some things in important areas. Uh, you have already discussed here the whole business of proxy voting. Uh, you know, if this House can't deal with a matter of, of ghost members casting votes in, in committees, where uh, sometimes the, uh, the final product of a committee is determined not by the members who are there and who understand the subject, but by votes of people who never uh, came to the committee room at any time during the del deliberations. I think you, at, at that point, you, you cannot deal with the fundamentals of reform. Uh, the American people are disgusted with this in institution in large part because they don't think we're, we're accountable any longer. Proxy voting is one of the uh, worst aspects uh, of, of an institution that has uh, lost uh, a true accountability. Uh, and so I think we need to deal with some issues like that. Uh, I, I would like to focus for a moment, though, on also this whole business of, of the bipartisan reform process. Uh, I have been a part of the, the recent um, undertaking of bipartisan reform in this House almost from the, uh, fr fr from the onset of it. Um, I was a part of the task force that was put together in order to try to deal with the scandals that erupted in the House, in the bank, the restaurant, the post office, and elsewhere, uh, where we attempted to reform the structures of the House. At that time, we suggested that there were some reforms that had to go beyond that, and we were told, no, you can't take those up in this particular venue because those are legislative matters that are going to be dealt with in a larger legislative sense. And so what we produced was a package supposedly to reform the administrative structures of the House. What we found as a result of that bipartisan process was that it did not work bipartisanly, that we ended up with a bill on the floor that most Republicans could not support because it was written by the Democratic leadership, largely to reflect the will of the Democratic leadership. Even that reform has not been implemented. Parts of that reform that were turned over to the um, uh, uh, Administrative, the new administrative officer of the House, uh, the House Administration Committee refused to let go of, the chairman of that committee making a statement uh, on the record, the official uh, statement is that they would not uh, turn over the House information systems to the new uh, administrative director of the House because, and I quote the chairman, that was a resolution passed in the last Congress which is not binding on this Congress. Well, I would suggest at that point that if the Democratic leadership's reform proposal can't be implemented by the chairman of this House because it's a Congress old, then we have not much chance of ever affecting real reform. But then we took the next step. We went to the, to the legislative uh, reform process that this bipartisan committee was supposed to reflect. We heard testimony. Most of us participated actively in what took place on a bipartisan manner. And in the, in the information gathering process, we had a truly bipartisan uh, uh, situation. That was until we went to, to the chairman's mark on the bill, where Republicans wanted to put a lot of the items we'd heard in the information gathering process. We wanted to take a lot of the things we had heard and put them in the chairman's mark and then separate them out. Why? Well, because then an amendment that lost on a 6-6 tie would in fact hold the, the reform in place not get rid of the reform. You, the, the only way you could get real reform, real substantive reform in the process we ended up with was to offer amendments to do more and have those turned down on a 6-6 tie. Well, at, at that point, it seems to me, when the mark reflected only the will of the Democratic leadership and did not reflect the will of the, of the total bipartisan uh, committee, we lost bipartisanship. And I will say that you will put the final nail in the coffin of bipartisanship if, in fact, this committee comes forward and allows only the Democratic leadership bill to go to the floor and, and does not allow all of the subject matters heard by the bipartisan committee to be addressed on the floor. Um, it's not good enough to simply offer the Republicans a substitute. That will be no different than the partisan vote that we have at the beginning of each Congress. Uh, we, if we're going to have bipartisanship, if this, is, if, if this is truly going to be a bipartisan effort, then what you have to do is allow the amendments, at least the amendments, that were offered in the committee to be offered on the House floor, to, to have these matters addressed. 
Otherwise, there will be no bipartisanship, and you can expect uh, that Republicans will trash this reform process on the floor and in public as being um, uh, completely inadequate. Uh, it seems to me that does the House no good. Uh, the, and um, uh, I would hope uh, that uh, some of the things that we were able to achieve in the process uh, can be achieved because we have a bipartisan bill that comes to the floor, that we are able to do an amendment process that strengthens that bill, or at least allows the House to work its will, so that in the end uh, we end up with, the, with a product uh, uh, worth voting for. Uh, but uh, if, um, if in fact the final nail is put in the coffin of bipartisanship uh, in, in this committee, uh, then I think we will have missed a, a, a great opportunity to effect real change in the House of Representatives, and that will be a tragedy. Right, thank, thank you. Mr. Um, I've got to run down the floor to vote. Mr. Solomon, would you take over, please? I'll be back in a couple of minutes. And if by any chance you finish with Mr. Walker, I think Mr. Swift is next. Mr. Mr. Swift is the next one to testify. Thank you. And Bob, uh, if I might ask unanimous consent, uh, before you leave, Tony, just unanimous consent to submit uh, Bob Michael, the uh, Republican leader's statement for the record. No objection. Uh, in, uh, in submitting uh, our Republican leader's statement, uh, Bob, he, uh, he says, I speak now not as a Republican nor as a Democrat, but as a man of the House. And he plagiarized that, uh, that sentence from uh, one of the most partisan but fairest speakers that this House has ever known, Tip O'Neill. That was his, uh, his statement. And he was uh, a partisan uh, uh, Democrat but he was extremely fair. Um, Tip was a partisan who liked a good fight because he thought his yeah. ideas were good yeah. enough to win in a fair fight. And the problem with, with many of the, uh, of the leaders of the Democratic Party today is they don't want a good fight. They don't want to test their ideas against, uh, against other ideas because they're afraid they'll lose. Yeah. Uh, in not only in the Congress, but in the court of public opinion. And so therefore, we don't structure fair fights anymore. Tip yep. loved a good fight, and, and, yep. and he tried to make them as fair as possible because he thought, yep. he thought they were. That's right. right, because he enjoyed winning. That's and, right, uh, because he, he enjoyed winning. And, uh, that's exactly right. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's right. I'll submit this for the, uh, for the record. Uh, Bob, first of all, I just want to commend you for your, uh, for your work uh, on this committee. You know, this, uh, this committee put in uh, hundreds of hours and uh, in spite of your position as the uh, Chief Deputy Whip and uh, ranking member on the uh, Science and Techs Committee, which takes up so much of your time, uh, you were there, I think, just about for all of the hearings that, uh, that we held. And, uh, and you're absolutely right. Uh, members coming before us to testify, members of Congress, not just the people from outside, uh, from the uh, think tanks, but um, Republicans and Democrats alike, talk about the fact that we needed to be bold, we needed to make changes to make this system work. You, in particular, uh, have helped me lead the fight on legislation dealing with illegal drugs. And we, uh, we mentioned uh, when Lee Hamilton was here before that uh, your legislation, mine, uh, and others dealing with this subject are tied up in no less than ten committees, uh, a dozen or so subcommittees, and that the legislation just cannot move. And that is legislative gridlock. And that is the very reason that this, uh, this joint committee was formed uh, more than a year ago, was to try to break that legislative gridlock, not between Republicans and Democrats, but uh, between committees. And uh, unfortunately, this legislation just does not deal with that. Uh, Hopefully, uh, uh, Lee Hamilton, the uh, chairman, the former chairman of our joint committee, has said he wants a generous rule. Uh, to quote him, he wants full consideration of all of the major issues that were brought up by Republicans and Democrats, but which were not allowed in the, in the committee mark. Um, Speaker Foley is on record, uh, and we have the press clippings here, of having, having said he usually supports his committee chairman. Uh, if Lee Hamilton wants a generous rule, uh, giving full consideration for all of these issues, and if the speaker uh, goes by the wishes of his, uh, his chairman, then hopefully we can look forward to having a meaningful debate on the floor with all of your amendments that were not allowed or that were voted down on a 6-6 tie. Um, I won't hold you up. I know you've got other things, but... Um... Well, I appreciate that, and, I, and uh, as I said in my testimony, it seems to me at the very least, those that were uh, re uh, rejected in the committee on a 6-6 tie ought to be voted on in the House of Representatives. What that means is that on a bipartisan committee, 
the members who heard the testimony and listened to everything that, 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 that was out there tied in terms of their beliefs about uh, whether or not this was a reform that should go forward. And that there, there was no true decision. Only a technicality of, of the laws uh, defeated those amendments. At the very least, those amendments that could not be agreed on uh, in, in a consensus way in the committee ought to be brought to the floor for the action of the total membership. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I would hope that all of the major matters that we thought were important enough to be addressed in, in the amendment process could be brought to the floor. But at the very least, the matters that were decided on a 6-6 tie ought to be brought to the full House because, in my view, those matters were left unresolved uh, in the reform process. <clears throat> well, the gentleman is right, and uh, Mr. Hamilton, of course, spoke uh, to the point that uh, he was afraid that if we included some of the amendments, some of the controversial amendments in the uh, in the bill, that uh, some of the old bulls would kill the bill, would never let it come to the floor, uh, even for a vote. Well, the fact is now that those controversial amendments are not in the bill, but they could be allowed now in the form of amendments. That would not prevent uh, the bill from coming to the floor uh, and having the House work its will. So uh, That's absolutely correct. And the fact is that we ought not let the old bulls drive the reform process. I've been around here a good while, so have you. Uh, we ought not drive the reform process. There are a lot of new ideas that are bubbling up in the country at the present time uh, that ought to be reflected in, um, uh, in, in what we deliberate in, in the Congress. Uh, and uh, it would be a travesty if reform to meet the, the, the standards of modern times uh, is, is ruled out of order because the old bulls don't want to deal with new ideas. Uh, uh, that, that would be the ultimate travesty uh, in uh, uh, what uh, started off uh, as a hopeful uh, kind of uh, process. I thank you very much for your testimony. Do you have any questions, Mr. Chairman? No, thank you, sir. I thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Excuse me. Mr. Swift, Mr. <coughs> Honorable Al Swift from Washington. <coughs> Thank you for being so patient, sir. We appreciate your presence I, here. And I understand the, the situation. Take as much time as you'd like. <clears throat> Swift's uh, sixth law is that if we were able to resurrect the 100 finest minds who had ever lived in the history of mankind and form them into a committee, it would take them about a half an hour to do something stupid. It is the nature of group decision making. Congress has always been held in some disrepute. There's always been a disreputable quality to us, and it started uh, long before Mark Twain and uh, Will Rogers uh, made some historic remarks about such things as us being the only legal criminal class and so forth and so on. We are the people who make society's compromises, and it's a task that will probably never uh, <coughs> draw a lot of gratitude. One of the things that we have to understand, it seems to me, in group decision making is there will always be tension between efficiency on the one hand and democracy on the other. The more you drive a democratic process to efficiency, the less the role is for every individual to play. The more democratic you make it, the less efficient it's going to be. And so that balance point is going to be adjusted from time to time, I suspect as various demands are placed on the institution, there is probably no set and forget exact balance as to where that should be. I will note, however, that the history of reform in the House of Representatives going back to King Caucus in the last century has been to diffuse power in the interest of democracy. And we now find ourselves under a lot of criticism, both internally and externally, <coughs> that the institution simply can't make decisions. Well, it suggests, perhaps, that if efficiency, if making this place work better is our goal, that then we have a, what was going to be a rather unpopular task of reconcentrating to some degree some power within the institution. The fact is that I think that the Committee on the Reform of the Congress didn't ever quite decide what it is it wanted to achieve. And I would suggest, with all due respect to you, Mr. Chairman, uh, as the person who's going to be the subcommittee chairman on this, this is a basic decision you may want to give some thought to. That is basically what are we trying to achieve. 
because there are all kinds of worthwhile goals that in fact can be contradictory. For example, I think it is an absolutely worthwhile goal to try and make this institution more responsive. It is also an absolutely worthwhile goal to make this institution better able to make tough and unpopular decisions. The two goals are diametrically contradictory. Which is it we want to achieve? And I think you'll find in some of the proposals that have been sent to you by the Joint Committee, uh, you're going to find some of those inconsistencies. Because we struggled under <clears throat> a double problem with democracy. Not only were we uh, a democratic committee, but we had as a chairman a committee. And let me rush to say that I have, uh, I have high regard for the performance of both Chairman Hamilton and Chairman Dreyer. But the fact is, in order to make it bipartisan and bicameral, the chairman was a committee of four people. And I think it really, uh, if, if the argument that you need some ability to direct a legislative process by the very way we structured our committee, or it was structured for us, uh, we were set uh, on a path that would lead to some inconsistent proposals, some disagreement, and, uh, and, and some of the criticisms that have been laid uh, at the work product. Uh, you are not here just to decide what kind of a rule comes to the floor. You are here more often than the Rules Committee is, is to decide the substance as well. And I think that is a flaw in our structure that you also should, uh, should be aware of uh, as you seek to determine precisely what will come to the floor. Some specific things that I think the Rules Committee needs to address, one I've already discussed, is the purpose. What is it we're really trying to achieve? And then evaluate every proposal you put in it as to whether it helps you achieve that goal, or however valuable it might be, does it in fact, is it in fact in conflict with the goal you're trying to achieve? Second point is the filibuster. I'm going to try not to duplicate what uh, Mr. Obie has said. I agree with him fully. Uh, it is not just a matter for the Senate because the, by the use of the filibuster, the Senate, a minority in the Senate, can negate work achieved by a majority of the House of Representatives. It is an issue in which we, the House, have a very decided purpose and interest. I would suggest, however, that there is a compromise to be made here. Uh, while I personally and philosophically believe that the filibuster should be abolished, I think there's no justification in a democratic society for a rule that permits a willful minority to prevent the majority from ever making a judgment or having a vote. The purpose of the rights of the minority is so that they have the opportunity to create majority. But it assumes ultimately you're going to vote, and the filibuster assumes that you have to prevent majority rule. But I point here. If the filibuster to return to its historical role of being used only on occasion in extreme matters of uh, broad interest and there was a penalty for using that technique one of sleep sometimes help I can remember as a child when there was a filibuster they were bringing cots into the room and all of that now they have made the filibuster so it's just another arrow in the quiver of any minority group in the Senate who chooses to use it. If you agree with me that it is fundamentally anti-democratic, and secondly, that it is now not used in extremis, but used in an ordinary, normal course of things, it is something that has to be addressed. And I would suggest that it's important enough that if, we, if the Senate is unwilling to address it in their rules, we should undertake to deal with rules in the House, which, for example, would uh, considerably circumscribe what non-germane material they can stick in, uh, in conference reports. And uh, by, by getting a handle on some of their practices, as they, through the filibuster, have on ours, create a situation in which we might be able to negotiate some uh, better situation than we have currently. The, limiting, the limitation of committee slots, whether that's done by, uh, and I, I support the way it's proposed, to two, uh, allow membership on two committees and two subcommittees only. And I would say by two, su two subcommittees on each committee. Uh, that proposal seems modest. Ah, Jonathan Swift had a modest proposal. 
That is masquerading as milk toast, and that proposal is the whole. The ripple effect from making that work will be a tidal wave in a number of major respects, and I think the committee should give serious consideration to how it's enforced, because I think it can have an enormously positive effect on this institution in a number of the areas we've talked about, and I'll elucidate them. But it's got to work. And if you leave the judgments to the respective leaderships of the two caucuses, uh, it's going to be very hard for the leadership to enforce it. I sit on steering and policy, and everybody that wants another committee assignment always articulates, I will lose the election if I don't have this. Well, both caucuses are interested in their members being reelected, and we give the most outrageous quantities of committee assignments to people. <clears throat> the leadership has got to be able to point to rules, and they've got to be able to point to rules that have been adopted by the House <coughs> as the reason that the rule of two committees and two subcommittees, period, that's it forever, uh, so that they can point to those things as, as uh, their reason for not being able to cave. Once you do that, I think issues of the number of committees is going to get addressed by what people will not serve on. The question of how many subcommittees you have, I think, is going to be quickly addressed by how many people you're just not going to have the slots for six subcommittees. I don't think you need to go about and pass special rules on the number of subcommittees and all these other... That will take care of itself in a marketplace kind of fashion. Uneasy for Virgos like me who like to go around straightening everything on the desk. But for all practical purposes, the, the goal will be achieved and will be achieved with less controversy than it will by taking it head on and trying to run the truck into the brick wall. I think you're going to find issues such as committee attendance. I don't find most committee, most people who don't come, I chair two committees, so tell me about people not showing up. But I don't find it's usually because they're lazy or that they're sitting in their office. It's because they're in some other damn committee. They have too many committee assignments. And I think you eliminate that and maybe reinforce it with some of these rules about attendance being taken. You're going to solve the problem of committee attendance and probably reduce the situation on proxies to a moot point. Moot in the sense that it probably won't be used so much that it's still a big deal for the Republicans, and probably it won't be need to be used so much that it'll no longer be a big deal for the Democrats. So I see that one apparently modest proposal that I have seen denigrated as, as minute and uh, an example of the timidness of the proposal as being a very powerful proposal, and I would strongly urge you not only to maintain it and pursue it, but to refine it so that it, along with some attendance requirements and what have you, really uh, can be enforced. And I think it will drive many of the other goals that have been talked about already this morning uh, as uh, important reforms uh, in the process. Just a few quick other thoughts. Committee jurisdictions. Again, I think Virgos like to do that. But I think it's worthy of remembering that you can't, in the modern world, ever come up with a jurisdictional map that will totally eliminate joint jurisdictions and things like that. The world is too complex. The problems we get here are not so discreet. So the best you're going to do on, under that process would improve, not perfect. And secondly, as rapidly as things are changing, it will become less relevant in a very short period of time. In the 16 years I've been in Congress, energy has gone from a little minor issue to a major one. Uh, Health care is beginning to do that as well. Telecommunications has done that as well. That's all in my committee on energy and commerce. And so I think that, uh, that if you go through the agony and the blood and the guts and all the rest to reform the committee jurisdictions, you've done something that may have some benefit for five years and it'll start to unravel. If you can achieve the purpose of the endless sequentials in another way, you might get a lot farther. And I would, uh, I would urge you to take a look at the proposal that would uh, change the rules similar to the Senate so that the Speaker would give one committee primary jurisdiction. That committee would drive the process and it would change it significantly from the system we have here and I think sharply reduce 
the uh, number of jurisdictional battles that we currently have. I also think that is something that is probably generally acceptable to most of the people who are going to be very upset with a whole jurisdictional rewrite. Finally, uh, <clears throat> the four-day week. I strongly support it. I have a suggestion. Because the question is, how do you enforce it? How do you enforce it? Good question. But if we had votes on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, reserved Monday, or excuse me, Wednesday for a committee day, there are some members who live close enough to home they could get on a plane and go home for Wednesday and back, but most members could not. And it would give those of us who are chairs a whole day in which to schedule hearings and markups without our members having to run over the floor, uh, and it would just simply not let most members get away. Uh, I think that something like that should be seriously considered as a way of enforcing the four-day week. I think the four-day week is an infinitely more practical solution than three on, one off. And I would urge you to take a very close look at the Senate where they have that, where it does not work, and where arguably they spend less time here than they did in the old days. Because what they've got now is their one week off plus the Tuesday through Thursday club going on the other three weeks. So making a four-day week, four weeks of the month, probably is a better solution, and I think the uh, no votes on Wednesday might be the way to make that work. I thank the committee very much for uh, not only listening to me, but we now pass you a ball, and this is a very serious responsibility, and I wish you well. Thank you, and uh, we thank you, Al, very much for your testimony, which this member at least found particularly persuasive on a number of counts. Just one quick question. Are there any things that you personally would have preferred to have seen in the package which were not adopted? I mean, any, any good ideas that uh, were dropped along the way that you want to recommend to us or commend no, to our attention? No, I... I may be a kind of a weird cat. I think I have supported every reform that has come along in my adult political lifetime, but I always think that it is smart to take some steps that will, that will cause change, then evaluate that before you take the next step. And I think what's in that basic package can have profound effects. If we start layering a lot of stuff on top of it, some of it will inevitably be contradictory. Uh, and, and you'll never understand what of the larger package had the good effect and the bad effect. So I think, I think uh, if you will, forcefully implementing modest change can be, the, be what will really affect improvements in the institution. You know, what, what I'm so afraid we're going to do is we're going to have inconsistent ideas in here. Maybe they're all individually good, but so inconsistent that when we get done, we will have an institution that works about the way it worked before, and what we will have done and called reform is moving the food all around on the plate. What we are very perilously close to doing is having a lot of change with very questionable reform. And those who say we got to do more, got to do more, be bold, and all of that rhetoric, I think are overlooking the fact that something that may not get us any praise in the editorial page of the Washington Post may do more to make this institution work better than some of the dramatic things that are really kind of mindless. Thank you, sir. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I should say, Al, it was a pleasure working with you over the past year. We've had many lengthy discussions on this issue. Um, I may have used the term bold, but I didn't wave my hands when I did it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so let, let, me, uh, let me say that, uh, that Lee and I uh, have come to sort of an agreement on the rule. I'd like an open rule, obviously. But uh, Lee said, as you recall, uh, at the close of our markup on that Sunday before Thanksgiving, that that uh, he would request a generous rule which would allow basically the items that we discussed in the committee <clears throat> to be considered for, uh, for vote here. Now, you said that the responsibility lies with those of us who were on the Rules Committee, and uh, <coughs> you know, I'm in this unique position, as is Mr. Solomon, to have been on both the, yes. the Reform yes. Committee and yes. a member of the Rules yes. Committee. Would, do you concur with Lee on, on uh, the goal of 
trying to ensure that the items that we discussed in the uh, Joint Committee will be considered on the House floor? Ask me later. And, and the reason I say that is that this is an unusual Rules Committee hearing in that you people are really going to deal with substance. It's almost a case of where the Joint Committee on which the three of us serve um, did some general groundwork and now <coughs> some discipline has to be brought to it, uh, hopefully by the Rules Committee. If a purpose uh, is defined, if every proposed change is measured against that purpose, if all of the proposed amendments are measured against whether it will advance or whether it will be a retrenchment toward the purpose, if the Rules Committee does that well, I would think a, an open rule that would permit other ideas that advance the agreed on purpose would be well served. Uh, if the committee is unable to define a purpose and unable to develop the discipline, as I believe we did not, to limit its proposals to what advanced that purpose, uh, then I don't, I don't know that uh, I would be for a broad and generous rule. I do think whatever the rule is, if you get that, if you get that uh, discipline, that you should not make in order rules uh, or, or, or amendments, however laudable for some other purpose, that do not reinforce the fundamental purpose you're trying to achieve, whether that is more responsive government or more, do you not, uh, do you not think, Al, that, the, that the, the, the amendments that were offered in the committee were designed to pursue that they goal? Never, they never were run through. You remember on one occasion out in Annapolis at the retreat, I raised the question that we had never had a discussion of what we were trying to do. And one of our colleagues from the other body filibustered for 20 minutes and we lost it in the fog. <clears throat> we never returned to discuss that issue. I am hoping that will be discussed here and that every suggestion, mine and anybody else's, are run through that screen. Does this advance the purpose? I think there'll be plenty for reasonable people to disagree with there. But I think there are some good ideas which just would not be useful if what we're trying to do is make this place work better. Now, if what we're trying to do is make this place more responsive, then there are a whole bunch of things that will make it work better that can't be considered because they will have a tendency to make it less responsive. Um, I, it, so it, so I, I, I really hope that you guys will yeah. do a better job than we did. In my testimony, I, uh, or during questions when I was sitting in that chair, I uh, went through the stated goal that was in mm -hmm. the resolution. When, I don't know if you were here then, but it, 192, which did outline the responsibility that, <clears throat> that the committee has to make a full and complete study of the organization and operation of the Congress to recommend improvements which would strengthen the effectiveness of the Congress, simplify its operations, improve its relationship with and oversight of other branches of the U.S. government, and improve the orderly consideration of the legislation. I mean, Do you remember any instance in which we ran any proposal against those particular goals? Well, I, I mean, I felt that the amendments that we offered and the, the package that I wanted to support did pursue all of those goals. I mean, that, that was well, my perspective on this. And I, I think there was a lot of intuitive sense that we knew what we were about. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where I get to be a real Virgo. But we never did it. And that's what discipline is about. We never sat down and evaluated these things against those goals. Now, I, you, any one of us is smart enough to build all the rhetoric we want around anything we want to do to say it fits. But then we're also smart enough to catch each other at that. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about seriously deciding what our goal is and then measuring all these things against it. Uh, and that has not been done, sadly. And I think the place, if it's going to get done, it's going to get done in the Rules Committee. If I learned anything from you through this process over the past year, it's who the enemy is. The Senate. <laughs> that, just for the record, I have a friend of mine from the state legislature who says, uh, Al, you must remember that the Republicans are just the opposition. The enemy is the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Now, Dave uh, Dreyer covered most of my questions. I just want to commend you for having persevered all the way through. You were one of the, uh, the loyal members that did uh, put in a great deal of time, and I commend you for it. Thank you. Well, I, I, would, I would simply say that working with both of you, and, and, and there was a lot we didn't agree about, but it was a very agreeable process and uh, I got to know both of you better and uh, and respect 
both of you more for the process. Likewise. Thank you very much, sir. Our next uh, witness is the Honorable Gerald Solomon from New York, also a member of this committee. <coughs> Let me advise our other friends who are here waiting to testify. We appreciate your patience very much. We're sorry we took so, so much time with our first two witnesses, Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Dreyer. Um, next in order would be Mr. Gadenson and Mr. Emerson. If he shows up, Mr. Spratt and Mr. Allard. Ms. Holmes, Ms. Dunn. I guess we'll just continue as long as we can here. And uh, if any of you have to leave for a while and come on back, if you possibly can, we'll take care of you as soon as we possibly can. Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> well, I thank you, Mr. Uh, Acting Chairman. And um, again, let me commend you for your perseverance. Well, you were cheering it. I didn't call uh, you Acting Chairman. I called you Chairman. <laughs> But uh, you are one of the members that uh, attend just about every minute of every uh, meeting that we have here in the Rules Committee. So uh, wearing, uh, wearing two hats today, Mr. Chairman, let me just say that as a member of the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress, I really am grateful for this opportunity to testify here today. I want to commend this committee both the, for creating the Joint Committee back in 1992 and for scheduling these prompt hearings on its final report which was filed last December. Your continued assistance in moving this expeditiously to the House floor under an open rule will be greatly appreciated as well. I also want to take this opportunity to commend Chairman Hamilton and Vice Chairman Dreyer, as I did when they were testifying earlier, on doing a truly outstanding job of conducting and completing the work of our joint committee on time. And for something that means a lot to me as a fiscal conservative, uh, for finishing it at some $300,000 under budget. That is something that is <laughs> rarely seen uh, around here. We save money on you guys. We should uh, keep creating these that, committees. That, that's right. Save $300,000. Pretty, pretty soon we'd balance the budget. That's right. <laughs> I also want to uh, commend the bipartisan staff of the Joint Committee, and including the detailees from the Congressional Research Service, on compiling such a vast wealth of materials on this institution and the various reform proposals submitted to us. I only wish we could have used more of their ideas in our final recommendations. It certainly was not for a lack of trying on our side of the aisle, I can assure you. And that brings us to the central point of my testimony, and that is that while there are some excellent and constructive proposals in the package before us, it does fall far short of being the kind of major reforms of Congress we had all hoped for and called for back in 1992. This endeavor was supposed to produce the most comprehensive overhaul of Congress since the 1946 Legislative Reauthorization Act. When we reduced the number of House committees from, at that time, an astronomical 48 down to 19, and the number of Senate committees from 33 down to 15, and yet, despite the fact that the Joint Committee spent countless hours of hearings examining some 14 options, and you all recall, those of you that were on the committee, 14 options for realigning the House and the Senate committee systems along more rational and more functional lines, we have not eliminated one committee or changed one piece of committee jurisdiction. We are in the same jurisdictional mess as when we started. And gentlemen and ladies, it is a mess. Under the leadership of Vice Chairman Dreyer, we did present a comprehensive overhaul of House committees, but that amendment was defeated on a 6-6 party line vote. It would have eliminated six of the 22 standing committees. It would have eliminated 12 of our existing subcommittees. And much of the jurisdictional duplication and overlapping that is now responsible for, well, for so much continuing legislative gridlock and turf battles. Consider, for example, the fact that the President's Health Bill, President's Health Bill, is now pending before no less than 10 House committees, including this one. What does that portend for a rational, coherent, or effective health policy emerging from this process? I don't think it does. Mr. Chairman, no one has claimed the jurisdictional reforms proposed by us were ideal. And you heard Chairman Hamilton talk about uh, some of his ideas. There may be better ways to reform our committee system, but no attempt was even made from the other side to put forward a constructive alternative. Why was this? We are told that it, was, it would have endangered the chances for passage, that it would have stepped on too many toes and invaded the turf 
of too many powerful chairmen and perhaps even ranking Republican members. Well, Mr. Chairman, I for one think that's, that's one heck of a lousy excuse. I cannot think of any real reform that would be worth its salt that didn't offend someone. That's what reform does. Reform by its very nature is a change in the existing order and way of doing things. But that's no reason not to try. In fact, we had a specific mandate from this committee and the House to make that attempt. Read the resolution that formed our joint committee. The resolution creating the joint committee specifically charged us with studying and making recommendations on, among other things, and I quote, the structure of and the relationships between the various standing special and select committees of this Congress. Mr. Chairman, it is my hope that this committee could still play a role in assisting Chairman Hamilton and Vice Chairman Dreyer in developing a bipartisan committee reorganizational plan that could be considered on the House floor. We can still do that. Mr. Chairman, if there was one recurring refrain that ran throughout the Joint Committee's hearings over a whole year, it was that the existing organization of Congress is an oxymoron. There is little or no real organization of the way our work is done. Members in particular claim that they were spread so thinly, and this came from both sides of the aisle, were spread so thinly over numerous committees and subcommittee assignments that they could not do justice to any of them. And that's not easy for a member of Congress to admit, but it's true. And that in turn is reflected in the product of many of those committees and subcommittees. It is often unrepresentative of the will of the whole House or the people we represent. Mr. Chairman, when the same bill is run through a variety of committees, there is little or no policy coherence or accountability left in the process. This committee is perhaps more aware of these failings in our present system than anyone else, since it is here, you and I and the rest of this committee, that bills are often taken apart and patched back together by someone in a back room in the majority Democrat office. To give you just one example, when we had the reinventing government bill up here last fall, the chief sponsor of the new substitute was asked to explain it in some detail and he frankly had to admit that he couldn't because it was still being rewritten by someone else in that back room right over there. Mr. Chairman, I would ask, how can we be expected to effectively reinvent government when we seem to be daily reinventing ourselves? If that example alone doesn't argue for a more rational and long-term reorganization of this Congress, well, I sure don't know what does. Why are our committees and the legislative process in such a sorry state of disarray? Part of it is the tangled jurisdictional problem to which I've already alluded. Part of it is the number of subcommittees and member assignments which the Joint Committee, to its credit, recommended be reduced. Those latter reforms of reducing subcommittees and member committee and subcommittee assignments should have been made, should have made it easier for us to adopt two or other reform proposals that we offered but were rejected. The elimination of proxy voting and minority quorums. This committee does not have proxy voting. This rules committee that you and I sit on. The joint committee did not have proxy voting. The House Appropriations and Veterans and Ethics Committees don't have it. Some of the most important committees in this Congress don't have it. But all the rest of the committees of the House do. What's wrong with it? It is blind ghost voting in that members do not have to specify on their proxies how they would vote on particular amendments in the committees. They don't even need to know what amendments would be offered. They simply give a slip of paper with the bill number at the top to a friend, sign it, and forfeit their judgment to another member. Is this the way to guarantee representative democracy? Of course not. Mr. Chairman, the other committee rule which should have been abolished in this reform is one-third committee quorums for marking up bills and so-called rolling quorums for reporting bills. Taken together, they mean that a majority of a committee never needs to be present to make major legislative decisions that affect the lives of the American people. We have become a house of minority rule in the worst sense of the rule world. 
Not only are committee rooms often as empty as legislative shelves, the entire House has also been emasculated by the increasing tendency of the Democrat leadership acting through the committee to deny members their right to amend legislation. This is egregious. This Congress marks a record high of restrictive rules which limit the amendment process. 78% of all of the bills coming through the Rules Committee have choked off the full right of members, both Democrats and Republicans alike, to represent their constituents by offering amendments to major pieces of legislation. We are disenfranchising the American people with these gag rules locking them out of their own house. Now, Mr. Chairman, I understand that this is necessary from the majority's viewpoint, in part to protect weak committee bills and weak subcommittee chairmen from embarrassing challenges. That's a shame. Perhaps if we had a more representative and fully participatory committee system, it would not be so necessary to deny the House the opportunity to fully deliberate and pass judgment on these bills by way of amendments designed to improve legislation. After all, that's really why we're here. We proposed in the Joint Committee two ways to address this restrictive rules situation. One, either require a three-fifths vote to consider any rule which limits members' rights to amend bills, or number two, to permit the minority one amendment to any restrictive rule, either to open up the bill to all germane amendments, or at least make an order a few more than permitted by this special rule. Obviously, neither of these reforms would be necessary if the leadership and the Rules Committee simply went back to its pre-1980 mode of only restricting amendments on such complex matters as tax bills. And that's about all that was restricted prior to 1980. But I'm not holding my breath for that earth-moving reversal to take place, Mr. Chairman. In conclusion, I do commend the Joint Committee on some of the reforms it has proposed, including reaffirming the traditional right of the minority to offer a final amendment to a bill in the motion to recommit. That is our right. Changing to a two-year budget appropriation process I think can be terribly, terribly important if it stays in the bill, and I'm afraid that, uh, that uh, in a Democrat substitute, uh, from what I hear from some of the Democrat chairmen, uh, they plan on dropping that. Reducing the number of subcommittees and member assignments, requiring committees to adopt oversight agendas at the beginning of each Congress, bringing Congress into partial compliance at least with some of the laws it imposes on others, and I think we could have gone farther in that requiring publication of committee attendance and voting records, and I think that's extremely important, and making the congressional record an accurate account of marks actually delivered. Yes, these are a few small steps in the right direction, but I have to fault the Joint Committee for its failure to address any of the major issues that contribute to the continuing gridlock in this legislative process. Such failures to overhaul committee jurisdictions as uh, sponsored by uh, Congressman Dreyer, and eliminate such phantom legislative devices as proxy voting, as offered by Congressman Allard, and one-third enrolling quorums, to guarantee the minority one-third of investigative staff funds to make an equal playing field, to require committee meetings to be public in the same way that hearings are. I mean, that's what the American people want and make it more difficult to waive such House rules as the Budget Act and the three-day report layover requirement for bills and conference reports, and finally to reduce committee staffs and to require equitable party ratios on committees. Mr. Chairman, it is my hope that this committee will not attempt a major rewrite of the Joint Committee's recommendations since that would defeat the whole reason for creating a completely bipartisan joint committee in the first place, 14 Democrats and 14 Republicans. I would also hope that this committee will help Chairman Hamilton to keep his pledge of a generous rule, preferably an open rule, that will at least allow the major amendments to be offered on the floor, the amendments that were offered during our joint committee markup on this piece of legislation. I'm extremely disturbed about reports in some quarters that the Democrat leadership may only allow three substitutes to be offered one Democrat leadership, one Republican, 
and the Joint Committee version. That means that members are going to be shut out from offering individual amendments. That would be a sure sign that the majority has no interest in real reform whatsoever and only wishes to undermine the bipartisan start we have made by turning this into a partisan scratching match. Mr. Chairman, the American people expect much more and much better of us when it comes to cleaning up and reforming their house, and this is their house. They will surely see through any cynical attempt to torpedo this effort by polarizing things along party lines. Let's follow the precedent set by the 1945 and the 1965 Joint Committees and the 1973 Bowling Committee, this man right up here on the wall, and take this to the floor under an open rule that the full House can decide on these individual reform proposals. And failing that, I will just tell you as the ranking Republican on this Rules Committee that I would concede and compromise to something less than an open rule as long as it was fair. And to be fair, we have some 28 Republican amendments that were rejected, most on a 6-6 party line vote. None of these are dilatorious. None of these are amendments that individual members are afraid of. They don't deal with uh, pay raises or pay cuts for members of Congress. They are strictly for the purpose of breaking gridlock in this legislative process and being able to move legislation. That's all that's here. We would even settle for that, Mr. Chairman. And I just have to repeat one more time that Mr. Hamilton has said that he wants a generous rule, that he would be willing to make all of these in order so that they could be voted on individually. Speaker uh, Foley has given a commitment to Dave Dreyer, the uh, ranking Republican on the uh, Joint Committee, that he would support his chairman's request. Now that means that the Speaker of this House and the Chairman of this Joint Committee all want to give a fair and open debate on this matter before the House of Representatives. Let's don't let others in either Democrat leadership or rank and file members or old bulls try to scuttle this piece of meaningful legislation. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for putting up with all that and uh, I would be willing to answer any of your questions. Thanks, Mr. Solomon. We have to put up with you all year, so there's no reason why we shouldn't put up with you today, too. Um, I have two quick questions, if I may, Jerry. Sure. The first is, I take it you do support most of the, most of the proposals in the Joint Committee's recommendations, even though you, you felt unable to, to sign on uh, to, to, to vote it out. I support all of them. All the ones that they did come up with? Yes. Your argument is that there are many others that they should have come up with? Yes. Okay. My, my argument is that... I'm just curious uh, whether any of you are, are opposed to some of the things that, that the uh, Joint Committee did, in fact, recommend. No, the, uh, there are uh, issues there that we would like to have expanded on uh, to have perhaps written a different way. But out of um, uh, the effort of trying to compromise, of trying to be supportive on a bipartisan basis, we supported those Democrat amendments that are in there. We've been trying for years, some of us, to educate our Republican friends to, to refer to our leadership and whatever as Democratic, not Democrat. Because it was, as I pointed out to you, the Senator from Wisconsin, Mr. McCarthy, who started that nonsense 30, 40 years ago. It offends us, but I'm just trying to suggest to you that you would offend us less if you would refer to Democratic leadership, Democratic proposals, rather than Democrat ones. But well, Mr. It Chairman, doesn't seem to take. I've, mm -hmm. I've said that to you on a number of occasions. I would feel a lot kindlier toward some of your suggestions if you'd take some of mine. Well, Mr. Chairman, that as a anyway. former Democrat, I can understand your feeling uh, <laughs> that way. Anyway, I have one other comment, and it's, it's, it's sort of a question and comment, but you all say quite correctly, and Mr. Hamilton agreed, and I guess we all do, certainly in theory, that it would be better if we could more, if we could rationalize the committee set up structure and have fewer committees than we, than we do now. The, the one example you gave, Jerry, was that, um, although I'm sure some of the committees would have only, a, would only have a minor part of it for perhaps a very small, uh, small, uh, short, a period of time that uh, I think you said 10 committees would have some piece of the president's yes. proposal. Now, if in fact, I don't know if you, you probably, you all probably don't have the answer to this right off the top of your heads, but if, if in fact we'd restructure things as you all, as you had suggested at least one occasion to reduce from number of committees, standing committees from 22 to 16 and to eliminate, I think it was 12 subcommittees. Do you have any idea at all whether or how many committees of president's health proposals would have been before? I suppose still maybe seven, eight or nine. I mean, that would have only partially solve the problem. And maybe none of the subcommittees that would have been uh, you know, eliminated uh, would be those that deal with his 
I mean, it's, it's a bigger big... problem. I mean, you know, just rationalizing this wouldn't solve this problem entirely. It's not an argument for not trying to do something more, but... I don't think it would solve the problem, but it would certainly help, and I would be glad to yield to the sponsor of the amendment. Yeah, there, there were, um, in the plan to reduce from 22 down to 16, there clearly, and I don't know the exact number, would have been a reduction in the number of committees that would have, would have uh, faced this, um, the issue of the President's health care plan. I, I think that, um, again, and I, I said this uh, when Lee was talking about incentive-based change, seems to me that we need to have a starting point that is different from the system which has been in place for half, the, the committee structure that's been in place for half a century. And, and so that's why I think it's important for us to, to begin with a reform plan of the committee structure and then uh, move from there with modifications. You know, the, the thing that Lee was saying earlier is that we're, we're in a position now where we really can't, because we'd step on the toes of individuals, make changes that are uh, very strong or for lack of a better term bold but it seems to me that now is the most important time for us to pursue that. You know, I agree completely with you David at the same time I must say I find myself in agreement with with Lee not saying that we shouldn't step on toes but that if if you do proposal propose a fairly useful and rational change you just blow the whole thing apart you'll lose so many votes. But with all these new members We're not coming worried about in, offending anybody yeah. that's fine. With but all if these you, new you, members coming in though uh, this class that we yeah. have of now 115 oh, freshmen point. and then the, the new members we're going to be ha having next year, the number of committee chairmen who have already announced their retirement, it seems that we're not going to be at a more propitious time to do it than now. No, you're right about that, clearly. Tony, if I just might, uh, you know, you, uh, you are uh, one member on the Democrat side that has broken ranks and uh, sometimes shown some, uh, on the Democratic some, some independence side. on the Democratic side, all right. Uh, but the point is that we are not asking to have the realignment of committee of the committee structure uh, in the committee mark, because you're right, that could probably kill the bill. But if we have an amendment made in order to it, and then you let the House work its will, let it vote up or down, mm -hmm. let those old bulls try to kill that amendment on the floor. And if they succeed, fine. If they don't, it's too late by that time. We've got the bill on the floor, the amendment has passed, and then we've had some real reform in this House. Actually, you and Bob Walker keep referring to those old bulls, but I, I noticed the other day that you and Bob were talking to each other on the floor of the, of the House, and a couple of new members walked by and said, who are those two old bulls over there? <laughs> I just made that up. But, you know, I mean, you've been, you've been around for a while, too. You probably look like an old bull to some folks. You're, you're a good storyteller. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Dreyer, do you have any questions for this gentleman? Uh, just the, the fact that I uh, enjoyed serving with him on the committee. He put a great deal of time and effort into this, and he encouraged me to take the, the post at the outset. Uh, I should say that, that repeatedly during 1993, people referred to the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress as the most important committee in the Congress at that time, and the reason is that the work of this committee clearly has the potential to improve our response to everything from health care to national security issues and all of the many different challenges that we need to face as uh, the greatest deliberative body known to man. And uh, you have done a fine job, Jerry. I mean, we, we see uh, here in the room my classmate, Sam Gadenson, who indicated to me in the close of the markup that he wanted to work on committee jurisdiction issues. And I, I would like to think that in a bipartisan way we would be able to do just that. And, and uh, if we get a rule which allows for consideration of a major reform of the committee you structure. You guys should stop talking about this rule. Maybe we can do something about it. But I will make the commitment. Getting so I will make the commitment about that, that uh, I will work yet. with uh, Sam Gadenson and others who have indicated that they want to make some modification in that, uh, in that committee reform proposal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank I thank you. the gentleman for your time. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. Next, the gentleman from Connecticut, the Honorable Sam Gadenson. Welcome. I thought he is that on now? Yeah. I thought he was filibustering by the length of his statement, but that's the other body, and that's uh, some issues that I think we ought to deal with. Um, I'd just like to do a couple of brief things, and I think the reality check needs to be on how to make this system end gridlock, to be productive, to have a deliberative uh, a process where there's a real debate, but not to allow a process that gets tied in knots uh, unintentionally or intentionally. And I guess the place that I'd start is I do think we need to look at uh, committee jurisdiction, and I would think the best way to do it 
is not necessarily by a reduction in committees, but m my main focus is not how many subcommittees you have, because I often find that small and what appear to be irrelevant subcommittees under you know, leadership of a good chairman that work hard accomplish some amazing things and it's having that entrepreneurial spirit of you know one small group of members kind of focusing in on on whatever the issue is does produce a lot of very positive results legislatively so I'd say I grew up on a dairy farm in a sense the marketplace ought to come to bear here and the two areas that I talk about one is the number of committees I think we've taken the right approach you limit the number of committees an individual can serve on that will thereby limit the number of subcommittees and the number of full committees that survive in the process. And if one year there's a greater interest in energy and more people want to get on it, I've always been somebody on the Democratic Steering and Policy Committee that said, let's it, let it expand if some more members are interested. On the years where there are, there's less interest, we shouldn't use temporaries, we ought to let committees shrink. And, and that will uh, deal with the kind of number of committees that are out there. On the scheduling, I have a real problem even with our proposal. Uh, and that is that we try to arbitrarily set the time uh, for Congress to meet. And the problem with that is we're not a, a, a business that has a regular production schedule. And again, I'd go back to my farm upbringing and say, you know, if you told farmers that they had to put in the same amount of time every week of the year, no matter what the season is, you would have, you know, some weeks where I guess we'd go out and stand in a field covered by ice. What happens in, in Connecticut, which is pretty covered by ice uh, at this stage of the game, is sometimes in the winter the farmer doesn't have all that much work. Milks the cows on a dairy farm. And in the summertime you may go flat out all day and all night milking the cows, taking in the hay, mowing the next field for the next uh, uh, day's hay to be taken, and then milking the cows again at the end of the day. We're in the same kind of situation here. At the beginning of the session, when the subcommittees and committees are meeting, there isn't reason to be in Washington all the time uh, for five days or three weeks on and one week off. And at that point, we ought to be back with our constituents, and we should be back in our districts, listening to our constituents, working with local government and state government on issues that we care about, bringing the feedback that lets us do a better job back here. By the time you get near the end of the legislative session, we ought to be here five days a week, almost uh, every day of the week and every day of the month that's necessary. And I think you've got to leave that up to management in the Congress to determine with as much predictability as possible, but to determine when the need is there. Uh, because it's a little foolish to me to kind of set up a time schedule that, that confronts reality and says, no, 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 we're going to get all the same level of uh, of activity on the floor uh, in January that we have at the end of the session. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't work that way. There are some days that we have to work here, frankly, from 8 in the morning till midnight and later. Uh, there are some weeks where we can go back to our districts and work in our districts. And I think that to try to arbitrarily set that hasn't worked in the Senate. I don't think it'll work in the House, frankly. Uh, we need to let the schedule flow with the work and that's the only way for us to get our job done, in my opinion. What I would do on committee jurisdiction is, uh, is to say that I think what we ought to do is give the chairman uh, and, and the leadership, obviously, of both sides will play a role in this, uh, a year to negotiate out amongst themselves some swaps in jurisdiction. I know, for instance, between Merchant Marine and Fisheries and Interior, there's some clear areas that could be shifted around in agriculture. After that, I would uh, establish, you know, basically a base closing commission that would come down and give an up or down proposal to the Congress so that you'd give the chairman and the process, you know, a year to work out some more parallel uh, uh, areas of uh, jurisdiction. And I would say, from my perspective, the number of committees is less important than cleaning up the jurisdiction and having as much parallel jurisdiction with the Senate as possible. I come from a tradition in the Connecticut General Assembly where frankly we had joint committees where House and Senate members sat together. Oftentimes we'd mark up a bill jointly uh, and then send it to each chamber where amendments might change it, but you come back to a conference committee that has a similar information base. I don't expect we'd be able to do that uh, very often here. I do think there are some committees, and I don't think the, the rest of my colleagues on the committee felt this way, that could become joint committees. Uh, the Intelligence Committee, clearly uh, the uh, House Administration Committee with the Senate Committee, 
some of those committees ought to be joint committees. They deal with the operation and functions of the chamber. Their legislative agendas are rather limited in a real sense. And those could be pulled together to see if we can get House and Senate members uh, to work together. I commend the Rules Committee for the challenge uh, that you're undertaking here. I think it's difficult. And I'd, I'd close by saying that in Al Swift, who um, I have great affection for, uh, and has a great voice. Even when he's wrong, he sounds right, because his voice is so good. But I think he is right that you do have to kind of war game these proposals. What people often genuinely offer as reform could create more log jams than expediting the process to get to a vote and give the American people uh, a Congress that works more. I think, frankly, we've broken much of the log jam in the last year in this Congress. I think we can go further, but I think we have to be very careful that proposals that have good intentions could be used by people simply uh, to create uh, filibusters in the House. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, very much. I agree with a couple of things you said, uh, that we have, in fact, broken the logjam to a certain extent, because the majority of the Congress is in agreement with the President on a number of, its, a number of uh, programs this past year, which, which hadn't been true in, in, in previous years. I also agree with you that, that reducing the number of committees might not in and of itself be you know, all that important, but, but you do need to straighten out the, the jurisdiction of those committees. Although, to the extent that you spread people to spread members too thin, I suppose it would be better to have fewer committees. I must say, make, you know, it's not important that I do disagree, but I disagree entirely with your original statement, your first statement, however, about our not having a regular production schedule, as I think how you put it, and that we don't need to meet a lot early in the year. I, I think just the opposite is true. Uh, in fact, the committees around here are too slow to do their basic work early in the year. They don't have enough members around. That is the time, always was in the state legislature, should be here the first three or four months before we have bills on the floor where everybody can go to their committee, his or her committee uh, hearings, learn a lot of stuff which they don't bother to learn. Most of them, when I mean, you chair a subcommittee, you have trouble getting some of your folks there, especially early in the year. And if you could be guaranteed their, their attendance here in Washington, even in the early months, I think you could do your work certainly more quickly and you'd have the help of a lot more members than you, than you, than you probably currently do. But anyway, um, <coughs> question for you, Mr. Dreyer, for your friend, Mr. Gaten. Uh Thank you very much, and Sam, appreciate it. I, you know, the one thing that, that concerns me about your statement, and I don't mean this as a criticism of you because we were, we were all busy through the process, but you've referred to the fact that we need to spend a year looking at a swap for um, no, many not jurisdictions. Looking at it. No, well, not looking at it. Or, or negotiating no, giving, it. Giving, the, giving the chairman. Right, yeah, himself. giving the chairman again. Okay, we need to, uh, you know, we, we need to war game these different things. Well, frankly, you know, in 1992, when this joint committee and the organization was put into place, I mean, it was a very intense effort that uh, was underway. We had uh, 243 witnesses before our committee. We put together, as I said in my opening statement, the largest compilation of information ever garnered on this institution. And we had that retreat that you attended uh, for that weekend in Annapolis where we all sat down and I'm uh, sure there was disagreement. But from that, we put together subcommittees. Bill Emerson here is here, is here agreeing and John Sprett. Those subcommittees were working groups that were designed to come up with recommendations uh, that we were to have. And frankly, the work was to be done by the joint committee. And then at the end of that year, and one of the great things about it, and one of the reasons that I agreed to take on the responsibility of co-chairing the thing with Lee was that we had a time when we were going to end and then bring it back here and move ahead with our reform package. And I think that, that uh, if we end up simply passing on the responsibility for more reform to some future committee that is going to deal with this, I think that our effort will have really been uh, a failure. And that's why I'm concerned, Sam, when I hear you talk about these steps that we take rather than just biting the bullet and doing what we're supposed to do. Reform the place. That's what the American people wanted. That's what the uh, resolution that established the committee called on us to do. Sam's yeah. suggestion, if I yeah. may say so, was limited to one very specific suggestion. Yeah. And yeah, that but was let, me, let me just say, Tony, well, I've sat and Sam has talked about this um, throughout the year and, and, uh, and, and talked about the idea of maybe looking at things down the road. And so it wasn't just this, but I mean, this is sort of yeah, well, a let me, continuation of what we've had. You can defend yourself in a moment, Mr. Gainson, <laughs> but let me, let me try to defend you. He was talking simply about committee jurisdiction and suggesting that we, we yeah. give an opportunity to, to you know, suggest some changes from the committees themselves. But his more you know, interesting suggestion, seemed to me, was this base closing commission idea that at the end of the year, we'd set this up, we'd, we'd, re we'd restructure the 
the jurisdiction of the committees and it would go into effect unless we're overruled by a majority on the floor, which is, seems to me would be yeah. unlikely. And, and I think the advantage of that is, uh, and particularly on this one issue, this is clearly, from the history of the Congress, the most difficult issue to get through Congress. There are genuine arguments on who should get jurisdictions. I serve on the Foreign Affairs Committee. I'm chairman of a trade subcommittee. I frankly believe we should be doing most international trade in our subcommittee. Folks on Ways and Means think it ought to be all, you know, theirs. And, and so those are very tough issues, not because people are fighting for jurisdiction. It's they believe that they're the best ones to handle that part of the process. So what I say is first we put them under the gun. And I do it in this bill that says that the, the committees have, with the leadership and the chairman of the committees, have a 12-month period in which to negotiate a, a realignment of jurisdiction. Yeah, those committee chairmen testified before right, us. They came, they came to us. Right. And I mean, I, I really felt that it was our responsibility to do that. Okay, let me explain. I mean, All right. you know, we, we are the ones who were charged with the responsibility of reforming the place and coming forward with this really unique structure to do I it. Think, I think, one, we have, a, we have a substantial reform package before us uh, that, uh, through the efforts of Chairman Hamilton, uh, have passed the committee and I think have an outstanding chance of passing the full house. The danger for me is that we lose some of this in a battle that is the most contentious, that is the most difficult and that frankly the proposal you had before the committee to me was unacceptable on committee jurisdictions and probably the proposal that I have at this point is unacceptable to just as many people. So it's not as if, you know, right. I think the best way to do this is set up a, a process in motion that gives us an opportunity, those in the leadership and the, and the committee chairman, I'm not a full committee chairman, to try to work it out and to, and to parallel that with the Senate. And then at the end of that year, they then have the hammer that comes down, which is a pre-appointed group. And based on your scenario right now, Bill Ford has announced as chairman of the Education Labor it's Committee, not he's the, retiring. It's not just the chairman. Okay, but, but you're talking about full committee chairman, Sam, and it seems to me that if we're going to have people who've served here together, I mean, for example, you know, Dingle and Ford, both from Michigan, they've been here for a long period of time. If all of a sudden a new chairman comes forward, they won't have the same kind of institutional perspective that a, that a Chairman Dingle will if have you, on an issue. If, and that's why it seems to me that independent of these chairmen, having taken their input, we should have been the ones to make the decision. We've still got a chance to do that if we can allow for our provisions. I, I, don't think that's, I don't think it's possible to do a good job of realigning jurisdiction and, and paralleling jurisdictions with the Senate and achieve the very positive things that are in Chairman Hamilton's uh, mark that passed the uh, committee already. And I think that, frankly, the advantage of passing what we've done and getting that into effect, reducing the number of committees people serve on, has a far more positive uh, impact. And I think that the jurisdictional issue can be better handled in the process that I described. And, you know, I think you can come forward with lots of proposals here, but frankly, the one you came forward before, to me, didn't make sense and didn't cut it. I think you'd, you'd respond. Anyway, Ch Sam's just trying to be helpful because you didn't get what you wanted in this thing. He's suggesting another way you might approach it. That's all. He's not saying that that's the only way. Right, Sam? Thank you. You're welcome. Good to see you. Mr. Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Bill, Hon Honorable Bill Emerson from Missouri. I have this opportunity to appear before you and uh, would ask permission to... Uh, without objection, uh, your entire... For the record and... Uh, push, push a little button, I, Bill. Push a little button on... To, Thanks. Thank you. In the interest of time, uh, you know, I, I know you've got a lot of witnesses. I, it would be interesting at this juncture, uh, following the gentleman from Connecticut, to get into discussion about a lot of the substance that uh, our committee dealt with. Uh, but I thought we were to be here today to talk about what kind of rule we ought to have as the recommendations of the committee move forward. Uh, so I will confine myself to that. Okay, but you can talk about anything. Well, it was the gentleman from Connecticut at our meeting down in Annapolis who in so many words said that he didn't see that the Republicans uh, as the minority had any rights other than those which the majority deigned to give us, so he didn't know why we're having all these deliberations and discussions about it. And uh, I hope that's not the spirit uh, in which uh, uh, the Rules Committee will move forward as uh, uh, as we seek to uh, address the recommendations made by the Joint Committee uh, because I think we operated very well as a, a bipartisan committee. Uh, uh, we weren't partisan throughout uh, most of all of our 
deliberations. We had a lot of good discussions and indeed a lot of good arguments, uh, but uh, uh, they were, uh, you know, we didn't probably come to the you know, uh, bottom line that I would have liked to have seen us come to, but I joined uh, Chairman Dreyer in uh, voting with uh, the Democratic uh, side of the House to uh, move the measure. And so here I am today saying that I hope we can improve upon it. It was in that spirit that I voted to report the uh, recommendations of the committee because I think this is a subject that uh, certainly the entire House should uh, have an opportunity to extensively work its will. And so I am here today to testify in favor of what I will call, and I'll try to give it some definition if you want me to, uh, a modified open rule so that the will of the House may well be discerned. And by, by modified open rule, I, I mean a rule that would permit amendments within the scope of the Joint Committee's deliberation, uh, but not opening Pandora's box to a whole lot of uh, other uh, reform ideas that really aren't relevant necessarily to the way in which Congress uh, goes about its business. Uh, the purview of the committee, what we had jurisdiction over, uh, as the Joint Committee would, in my view, uh, be a good rule of thumb as to uh, how, how open a rule we ought to have. Uh, you don't want just a totally open rule where you get into things like campaign finance reform and all that, but I think if we look to what the scope of the Joint uh, Committee on the Reorganization of Congress, uh, uh, its charge was, I think that's a good rule of thumb that should guide the uh, writing of the rule. Now, I, I have been concerned because recent media reports uh, have indicated that the House leadership plans to permit only two amendments, one from each party's apparatus during floor consideration of the Joint Committee's uh, legislation. And, and if this is true, uh, I, I would consider it both an outrage and an insult as an individual member and as a member of the Joint Committee. First, this action would fly in the face of uh, the bipartisan nature of the committee, and I think it would torpedo this institution's credibility. If congressional reform is put on this track and presented as merely a choice between some Republican vision uh, of how Congress ought to, ought to work versus uh, the Democratic caucus plan, then the Joint Committee will have been a waste of the taxpayers' money, a waste of members and staff's time, and a waste of the effort and commitment of the many uh, people who were involved in the process. It would fuel, in my view, the suspicions of many across the nation that the government uh, doesn't work and can't work. Finally, it would reinforce the public's notion that Congress isn't serious about putting itself under the microscope and making necessary changes. I've always believed that open and frank dialogue is the fundamental basis of the democratic process. Now, this is not a notion that I take lightly. Now, let me tell you that uh, I'm very strongly opposed, opposed, I say, to congressional term limits. Now, I'm belief that the, of the belief that the ultimate limitation of term uh, decision lies with the voters every two years. We've already got a good term limitation process in place. It's called an election, and we go through them rather frequently here in the House. But even so, even though I'm opposed to term limits, I, I've added my name to the discharge petition, which would allow the subject uh, to come to the floor of the House. I'm not afraid to debate the issue. I would welcome the opportunity to fully debate that issue and make my case against term limitation on the floor of the House. So while I don't agree with the substance of what's trying to be accomplished, I don't have any fear uh, of the process that would permit its discussion. It has surely come to the attention of the members of this committee that uh, we're just a couple of votes shy of a record number of defeated rules for a given Congress. And while many of my colleagues are probably swept up in the excitement of the pending Winter Olympics, uh, I can't imagine that this is a record uh, that the majority leadership would like to see broken. And uh, I, I therefore appeal for a, for a very uh, uh, considered rule and not an exclusive rule. I don't know yet of any grand st strategy to defeat a rule uh, that has not yet been proposed, but I do know that congressional reform is a vitally important topic to the rank and file members of this House, to both Democrats and Republicans. In fact, I would venture that the Rules Committee, if you grant a restrictive rule 
uh, on the Joint Committee's legislation, such as only allowing a caucus or a conf conference substitute, uh, there will be many, many unhappy, if not rebellious, members of Congress. The simple fact is that people don't like being shut out of the process, and a closed rule would do just that. During the first hearing of the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress, Speaker Foley and I got into a, a good discussion about what appeared to be two different views of reform. I suggested that the Democrats wanted, were interested in efficiency and would like to pass everything under the suspension of the rules and have limited debate, while the Republicans were interested in fairness and would like to have the opportunity to offer uh, every conceivable amendment to every proposition that came before the House. Uh, neither of those uh, are uh, correct, would be the right way to proceed, but I think they do both contain some important uh, uh, ideas and, and, you know, perhaps greater, greater fairness would lead to a higher level of efficiency. Speaker uh, fully responded that both were important, but that the element of accountability to the public superseded both fairness and efficiency. While I still believe that fairness is key to democratic government, I agree with the importance of accountability. And in, the, in this respect, any rule, in my view, that doesn't guarantee generous floor debate, and doesn't allow representatives who want to be a part of the process uh, to be a part of the process would be very detrimental and destructive to the Congress. Congr Congress needs to demonstrate that it is an institution committed to the public well-being and not to self-service. Uh, the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress was created to do just that, and I am very concerned that a restrictive rule would sabotage that effort. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, th we thank you, Bill. And this, for this member at least, let me respond by saying that, that, that I found your your testimony to be not only helpful but reasonable and thoughtful, and uh, I agree with it. Questions from Mr. Quillen or Mr. Dreyer? Bill, you always do a tremendous job. I hadn't heard before that the Rules Committee and the leadership intended to only make a few amendments in order. And yet we're talking about reform. And we're not practicing what we preach if, in fact, that is true. Seems to me the Rules Committee ought to loosen up. The leadership should allow more Republicans on this committee so that we'd have a balance like it used to be in years past. I've been on this committee 29 years. And I've seen only two majority on the other side. Republicans were almost evenly divided and we could get some of the majority to go along with us. But how in the world, when there are nine Democrats on this committee and four Republicans, can we get enough on the other side to go along with us? So if we're talking about reform, why don't we start right in our own kitchen? I commend you for your testimony, Bill, what I heard of it. You always do a great job, as I said. Nice to have you before the committee. Thank you. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Bill, you focused on the issue of, uh, of the rule, and I will say that, uh, that based on uh, the information that I've been given from our uh, staff, that of the reform proposals that have come before the Congress in years past, that if not everyone, close to every single one of them has been considered under an open rule on the House floor. And uh, I think the point that you make in your testimony is right on target. If we are going to uh, close this rule down, we've basically shut the door on the process that began in January of last year. Thank you very much. It was Thank a pleasure you. to serve with you. You know, before I leave the table here, I might say in, uh, in structuring a rule, the Rules Committee may uh, well consider an admonition that Speaker Foley gave us very early on that I thought was uh, a real gem. Uh, he said that as we approached the issue that was lying out there to be approached, he recommended that the majority 
could always put itself in the position of the minority and that the minority would put itself in the position of the majority uh, so that uh, we would understand better how each other felt. And uh, of course, as a member of the minority, I found that to be a very interesting exercise. Uh, you know, it challenged us to think in terms of fairness and uh, uh, how would we operate if we were the majority. Uh, that is an issue that always, uh, that always lies out there uh, in my thinking as I try to examine the efficacies of, uh, efficacy of rules that come before us uh, and looking at it for fairness. And so I would, uh, I would urge the committee to think in those terms and give us a fair rule. It's a good yeah. recommendation, Bill. Let me just say one of the problems that we have is as I talk to many of our colleagues in the minority, what I find them saying is, hey, you know, I would like to act responsibly if I were in the majority. But they feel often as if they've been pistol whipped to such an extent that they say, by gosh, when we get into the majority, we certainly are going to remember the way we were treated by the majority rather than the way we would want to be treated as uh, members of the minority. Yes. Thank you, Bill, very, Thank very you. much. The next witness is the Honorable John Spratt, Jr. from South Carolina. Let me say to you, John, and also to Wayne Allard especially, two of you have been sitting here patiently the entire day now for about close to four hours. Hope you've learned something in the process. You may not have. We've learned a lot. I suppose you knew most of these things beforehand, but we do appreciate your patience, and I'm sorry we didn't get to you beforehand. <coughs> we because of the long-windedness of your I appreciate your, your predecessors patience, and I'll and try to be as succinct as possible. Uh, actually, it, 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 it's, it's been we here on the Rules Committee that have taken up most of the time. You take as much time as you want. Thanks, sir. We've taken up most I of your time. I do have a already. statement I would submit it for the record. That objection will be included in its entirety in the record. And I also have an amendment which I would uh, seek to an have. amendment to your statement? Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. An amendment to uh, the bill itself, oh, which okay. I would ask the committee to consider to be made in order when it... Uh, Please. Uh, okay. Make sure you tell us about that. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to appear before you today to discuss the recommendations of the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress. When the Speaker called me and asked me to serve on this committee, I, I was honored. This is only the third bipartisan, bicameral panel established to carry out a ma major overhaul and review of the Congress. So I was eager to participate, and I gladly accepted his invitation. Now, more than a year later, I, th I can honestly say that I think we did a pretty good job of addressing the broad charter that we were given. Sure, we left some stuff on the cutting room floor. But we listened to hours upon hours of testimony from a broad array of witnesses, beginning with the leaders of both houses, including both parties, concluding with a former vice president, Mr. Mondale, we spent countless additional hours poring over stacks of proposals and background materials that were prepared by our committee staff, by the Congressional Research Service, by outside groups of all stripes and sorts, Congress watchers of all kinds. And the culmination of our efforts, the final report, which has now been introduced as H.R. 3801 by our Chairman Lee Hamilton, is not revolutionary, I'll grant you that. And to some of our colleagues, both on the committee and in the House. This is a disappointment. But I would say to you that this is a very sound, very firm step forward towards making Congress more efficient, more effective, and more accountable to the people we serve. Like most of those on the Joint Committee, I don't support every recommendation that's contained in this report. Although I voted to report it and voted for this specific provision, I'm still skeptical, for instance, of the benefits of a biennial budget. I think it may simply lead to a two-step process. In the off years, we will have a mini-budget, a major supplemental, and won't be that much difference. But I supported its inclusion in this bill because I think the issue merits debate before the full House. On the other hand, I think the committee, for the same reason, should have done more and said more about committee jurisdiction. Now, there was great concern, and I think it was warranted, that if we took up committee jurisdiction, restructuring committees, it would become a poison pill and embroil the whole package and risk the outcome of all of this reform effort. And I understand that. I understand the chairman's reason for caution. He wanted to move forward with things that could be accomplished and steer clear of this. But we could have reported, I thought, perhaps a menu of several different cho choices, ranging from a bold restructuring of House committees 
to merely cleaning up overlapping jurisdiction without taking a position on any, but simply submitting these ideas to the House for debate and consideration. I believe the House members of the Joint Committee have been given too little credit for a couple of major recommendations I haven't heard them focused upon today, and I might mention one is our proposal to improve ethics procedures in the House. The other is our proposal to bring Congress into compliance with those federal laws from which we are currently exempt. At the outset of the Joint Committee's year-long effort, many of us, myself included, stressed that we had to incorporate ethics reform and compliance into our final package, even if we did nothing else. These two items, these issues, clearly have a bearing on the public's perception of Congress and on the degree to which we are held accountable for our actions. When we discussed reforming House ethics procedures, we came to a consensus that oftentimes a bifurcated process worked pretty well. Having one body do the fact-finding, another pass on guilt frequently makes sense. So there was strong interest among some members in turning over one part of that bifurcated process to outside citizens, a group of upstanding citizens of Father Hesburgh types. And that has some merit to it. But I suggested that if we did that on a permanent basis and we turn that procedure of fact-finding over to a new Citizens Commission altogether, it might prove costly and cumbersome. And so we could have the best of both worlds if we simply established a pool of outside individuals, upstanding citizens of this country, which the Ethics Committee would have ready to turn to in extraordinary cases, where they felt it would be helpful to have an outside panel to call upon to stand, sit in judgment of some particular infraction of the rules by a significant member of the House. This is a form our recommendation ultimately took, and I think it makes good sense. A number of us felt that our committee should also use this opportunity to deal with the budget process, and we have budget process recommendations included in the report. We also have some that we left on the cutting room floor that didn't get passed. I offered two amendments during markup. Both of these passed the House in 1993. The first would establish an annual review of entitlement spending, including the establishment of a baseline, a series of direct spending targets over a period of three to five years, and a requirement that the President and the Congress address any variation from these targets annually, each year at the beginning of the budget process. This is not an entitlement cap, so-called, but a mechanism to ensure that Congress and the President face up to deal with increases in mandatory spending over and above what we budgeted and projected and expected. This amendment was included in the House version of the 1993 Budget Reconciliation Bill. When it didn't make the cut in the Senate, the President instead enacted it by executive order last uh, fall. It was also adopted, and it has been adopted, so that we can make it, pass it in statutory form as part of this particular recommendation, and I hope that the provision will remain in the bill reported to the House, and I hope that it will also survive so that we can embed it in law. The second amendment would establish an expedited process for considering presidential rescission requests. This bill, too, of course, was passed by a substantial majority in the House last year. This stops short of giving the President line item veto authority, but it is a significant step in that direction. The amendment would guarantee the President an up or down vote within a set period of time in both houses, expediting consideration of any request he sent over. At the same time, it would protect our discretion by allowing the appropriation committees to offer an alternative package which could be voted upon after the President's package itself had been voted upon by record vote. That particular provision I offered as an amendment to the Chairman's mark but it was not adopted. It failed by a 6-6 tie vote in the committee. I would like to offer the expedited rescission proposal, the same proposal the House adopted last year, as an amendment to be made in order by this committee when the bill H.R. 3801 comes to the floor. Mr. Chairman, I think this House owes our Chairman Lee Hamilton and our Ranking Member David Dreyer a great debt of gratitude for the time and the effort they invested in this endeavor. I think the bill before you is a solid product. I'm not saying it can't be improved or shouldn't be subject to amendment. I think it's worth having a debate. I voted on the things that the Republicans wanted considered, and I think the whole House might do the same. But I do hope that whatever is decided by the Rules Committee about rules amendments to be made in order 
you will expedite the reporting of this legislation so that we can have an opportunity soon to consider this very worthy legislation on the floor of the House. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, very much. Appreciate your testimony. I find myself in agreement with virtually all of it. One particular, just one, one item which I found particularly intriguing, your, your suggestion of, of making available, for example, a, a, men, excuse me, a menu of choices with respect to committee restructuring. Well, this was an idea for a taking up the committee issue without poisoning the bill with recommendations. Not a bad idea at all. Then my question to you is, could you or you, in conjunction with some of our Republican friends on that joint committee, well, come up with such a thing? I mean, were, were there some... You were there, were there some I laid out a proposal that I thought we, we effectively <coughs> abandoned some time ago in the interest of just pushing ahead with a bill that didn't... Well, maybe you could slip it to us secretly. I think it's so worthy of consideration. Maybe you'd be kind enough if we requested it of you to share it with members yeah. of the Rules Committee who are interested sure. in it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I didn't hear all your testimony, but what I did hear was excellent. The part you missed was really good, too. <laughs> I'm sure it was, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being Thank you here. Very. Thank, Thank you, you for Mr. being Quillen. so patient. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. a long, you. long day, and there's more to follow on the floor. Thank you very much. Could I leave my testimony to be included and also the... Uh, you certainly uh, may, and without objection. Morning. It will all be included in its entirety in the, in the record. Mr. Allard. <coughs> it's finally your turn. Thanks for uh, sticking around so long. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honorable Wayne Allard, gentleman from Colorado. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate this opportunity to testify before the Committee on Rules concerning the House version of the recommendations of the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress. The Joint Committee was, cons was consistently encouraged to take bold reforms for a system with some very deep problems. It is discouraging that as the process went forward and we examined this institution, the commitment to change our ways was increasingly paralyzed by an unwillingness to recommend bold reforms. I believe all the former Joint Committee members would agree that the document before you represents a minimum of potential reforms. Many of us reluctantly accepted this approach in exchange for the opportunity to pursue reform when the Joint Committee's recommendation reached the floor. From the records of the Joint Committee's work, you will see you, you will have seen that I've offered several amendments in the markup, but took a particular interest in accountability under the law. My constituents often tell me that they wonder how we can represent their concerns when Congress isn't required to play by the same rules. Both houses of Congress have taken steps to improve this situation, but the remedies are still unfinished. The document before you has a significant section on congressional compliance. While there are new mechanisms to deal with the question of how Congress might comply, the recommendations are a little above a retreat from measures the whole House adopted during the year. I feel it is very important that this reform bill require Congress to live under its own laws, not study how they might be applied or if they will be applied as the document before you suggest. This is not reform. It is treading water. Reform might include a blanket prohibition against congressional exemption or at the very least place the burden on Congress to demonstrate why an exemption is appropriate, just as in the private sector. We can also go further by including the excellent proposals offered by Representatives Faywell and Goodling who have devoted a great deal of time to studying and answering one of the most difficult questions, how, Cong how Congress might bring itself into compliance with the Occupational Safety and Hazards Act. Adopting these strong compliance reforms would make the process honest and people ever, everywhere would appreciate the commitment to accountability. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to comment a little more specifically on some of the provisions that are in the bill, uh, particularly as it applies to what's expected of Congress when it comes to complying with the laws that it passes. Within the bill, we have set up within the Office of Compliance an ability to study the laws as they might apply. Now the laws, um, it determines, then it will try in this study to determine which laws are appropriate to Congress and which are not. And then through an internal rule mechanism, 
come up with some recommendations. Uh, as it was first presented in the committee, I felt that through the internal mechanism that it would allow for an internal body without the vote of Congress to actually lessen the number of laws that the Congress has to live under now in congressional compliance. I worked with the chairman um, and we were able to come up with some wording that at least uh, assured the Congress that we would live under the same compliance provisions that we have now. There are some individuals who look at this wording and still are concerned as to whether or not we have uh, closed that loophole. Uh, I happen to feel that we need to take a strong step forward and even uh, say that all the laws that are passed ought to come, ought to come under the purveyance of the, or the Congress mem members of Congress ought to come under those laws, but that um, if there are some legitimate reasons for exemption, and I believe there are, then the Congress ought to be able to vote in an open manner on those laws that are appropriate to exempt itself. And I would use uh, as an example uh, the Intelligence Committee, for example. You know that we would not want to have uh, perhaps uh, some very uh, top secret uh, uh, issues uh, divulged in an open manner uh, at certain critical times in this country's history, perhaps when it was a war. So I think that there's a common sense approach that we could take with that. Now, what we've come up with is that, with, that most of these recommendations are effective only with the approval of Congress. Uh, the Office of, of Compliance is concerned about the costs of some of these things, particularly when we make them apply to OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Act. And my response to that is that uh, there's a lot of people out there that run their own businesses that have to deal with these costs. There's a lot of council people that have to deal with these costs in their budgets or whether they're state legislators or whether they are uh, uh, county commissioners or whatever. Local officials have to deal with these provisions. And I think that uh, if we expect them to have to deal with these costs, that Congress ought to have to deal with those costs in a forthright manner. And I believe it would help the members of Congress more closely relate to the people that they represent because they will see the impact of those laws not only on the Congress itself but within their own personal offices. I uh, made, an emo made some uh, amendments to eliminate proxy voting. Uh, I would go along with the general approach in the bill that says that uh, committees uh, are limited, members would be limited to the number of committees that they serve on, and that we have some attendance requirements. Uh, I supported provisions that would have done more to limit the number of committees that we have. I think that we can do a lot more, but I think that's a step in the right direction. I think that eliminating proxy voting helps a lot in assuring attendance at those particular committees, and also, also I think it will help uh, limiting the number of committees that members want to serve on because if they know that they have to be there to vote, then they wouldn't want to have that reflected in a negative manner on their attendance. I also uh, proposed an amendment that would have called for an equitable ratio of Republicans and Democrats on all the committees. Uh, I served in a legislative body before I came to the Congress in the Colorado State Senate and served in leadership, and we made a conscientious effort to look at the ratio of the members in each party on the floor, and then that was reflected uh, in the membership in the committees. And it did make some of the committees uh, rather tight uh, because we didn't carry a large majority all the time, but that was another incentive for members to be there because they knew that their vote was going to make a big difference on the outcome of the deliberations within that particular committee. I also had a proposal to uh, try and consolidate some of the non-political uh, agencies that we have here on the Congress. We have printing, for example, on the House side, we have printing on the Senate side. And I've made a lot of arguments that we ought to be moving towards an attempt to consolidate all these agencies on both the House and the Senate. Uh, the committee itself was reluctant to take any real firm, uh, bring forward any firm recommendations in that, but they did agree uh, to a study 
to look at this further. And I would encourage the Rules Committee to do everything possible to make sure that this study does move forward. Because I think it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to reduce the number of employees that we have on Capitol Hill by looking at the duplication between the Senate side and the House's side. Uh, another area would be uh, you know, some of the tourism provisions, some of the security provisions that we have. There will be a couple other areas in addition to printing where I think we could easily get some of that consolidation. I have to share with this committee again a story of a constituent of mine who came here to the, uh, the Capitol to visit and found that at certain times of the day that they weren't able to take a picture uh, on the House side, but they could go over on the Senate triangle and take a, take a picture over there. And I just think that that pointed out to, uh, to that particular individual uh, just how uh, different the House and the Senate was on the way they were administering the way they did business on both the House and the Senate, and probably was unnecessary to have that kind of a, a contradiction. It was hard for them to understand. This is our only opportunity to fulfill the promise that Congress will have the chance to consider a genuine reform bill. Uh, toward today, the approval rating of Congress is dismal, an appalling commentary about the public's lack of confidence in our capabilities. It is for that reason that I am here to urge that the Rules Committee allow the Joint Committee's document uh, the chance to reflect our sincerity about congressional reform. This effort began with noble intentions, a partisan endeavor somewhat insulated from political considerations. We need to continue that approach by allowing those who feel the bill could be strengthened to present their case on the floor. It would be extremely ironic if amendments to strengthen our reform bill were silenced by a closed or limiting rule. The American people deserve more than the bare minimum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Wayne, very much. Thank you, too, for being present for the hour or so that I testified before your joint committee. I wish some of the other members had been there. Perhaps some of my suggestions would have been taken more seriously. Mr. Dreyer, do you have any questions? Well, I was there, Mr. Chairman, and in fact, wielding the gavel and enjoyed your testimony very much. Let me say that... Uh, I don't think you were there. I was there. <laughs> Well, you were right about the I other thing it. you argued about before. I suppose I you're right it. about this. Too. I remember it. I remember Mr. Obi. I remember Mr. Allard. Yeah. I remember Mr. Spratt was there. I don't remember you. <laughs> well, Sorry. I guess my presence wasn't too memorable. I was there in spirit if I wasn't there uh, physically. Let me just say, uh, Wayne, that I uh, appreciate the fact that you spent a great deal of time on this very important issue of, of compliance. I said throughout the... Uh, the hearing process when I talked about the need to have Congress comply with it. One time my, my dad said to me, you all in the Congress should have to live for one year with any regulation you're considering promulgating on the American people and only after you've concluded that it's a worthwhile, very beneficial regulation should you consider imposing it on the rest of us. It seems to me that as we look at this issue, it's one that really gets at the heart of much of the concern that the American people have. And it's very understandable, the fact that we've had a pattern in the past of exempting ourselves from the laws that we impose on, uh, on the American people is an important one. And the response that you provided to those who say it'll be costly for us is the one that I've regularly said, hey, we're imposing that cost on working men and women in this country. And what we should possibly consider is maybe reducing that burden on them if we feel that we can't uh, shoulder that, uh, that cost ourselves here. Uh, you did an excellent job on the committee. It was an honor to be able to serve there with you. Uh, it uh, no longer exists, but I believe that we have an opportunity in the next several weeks to really ensure that the work of, uh, of that committee, which as I said earlier, compiled the largest compilation of information on the institution that's ever been put together, we'll have a chance to, to really uh, make it a success, and that's really going to be, de be determined in the weeks to come, and your effort here is very appreciated. Well, I agree with you. We did compile a lot of information. We spent a lot of time on that committee here in testimony, and I think we've given us something for us to build upon to make this a better place in which to serve, in which the American citizens can have more confidence in. And so I do hope that the Rules Committee uh, will move forward and maybe even come up with some better recommendations than what we did that would actually strengthen our effort for uh, congressional reform. I'd like to compliment you in working with uh, Congressman Hamilton on that committee. It was a pleasure for me to serve on that committee, and it was an honor. Nice comments, Wayne. Thank you. Thanks very much for being Thank here. Thank you.
Our next and our next to last witness is uh, the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, the Honorable Eleanor Holmes Norton. Good to have you here, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. um, let me begin by saying that I strongly support the recommendations of the Joint Committee, with an exception which I shall elaborate uh, presently. I believe that these recommendations have to be seen in the context in which they were born. Uh, the Commission itself was born out of crisis, and it was very different from um, commissions generated by other crises. In this case, in most cases, there will be a blue ribbon commission uninvolved with the institution itself, who then makes recommendations. Inevitably, because this is the Congress of the United States, we're discussing uh, what could be statutory and rules changes. The committee is uh, one step removed from the general body. Inevitably, many of the issues that took center stage were simply lifted from the House floor to this joint committee. Um, same actors, different forum. Uh, Chairman Lee Hamilton deserves particular praise, and I think has won it from every member of the committee uh, because he is chiefly responsible for what consensus was possible uh, in, in this uh, setting. As a matter of fact, there was considerable consensus on many difficult items. Um, I want to say a word about two in, in, in particular, the two that I think matter most. Um, the ones having to do with uh, ethics committee changes and compliance with the laws of the United States by the Congress of the United States. Um, as a matter of fact, beyond these, we reached a consensus on a number of issues uh, that I regard as uh, substantial. Uh, biennial budgeting, expansion of the House Legislative Week, from three to four days, restrictions on un unauthorized appropriations. These are, are issues that come to mind when one uh, thinks about uh, procedural issues that have reached the, pu the level of public concern. The minority itself, while complaining about the process throughout, was able to make substantial contributions. Uh, among them uh, biennial, biennial appropriations, uh, verbatim uh, transcripts in the congressional record, and of course the right of the minority to recommit with amendatory instructions. Uh, they're, they're, the, the minority will complain, has complained about the ties that resulted on some of its uh, measures without uh, indicating that they were willing to tie on our measures just as readily. Uh, some of these uh, uh, differences were very small and I think could have been reconciled very easily. I'll, I'll name one uh, in the area, one of the two areas that I said was of special concern to me. There were two different proposals about uh, the kind of review that should occur after a finding of discrimination. It's an, an issue of some moment for me as a former chair of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. This is one of these areas where I know more than I want to know, Mr. Chairman. And so the question came up as to whether or not there should be de novo review. That is to say, after you've gone through a hearing, then can you go to the district court and get another whole hearing? Or should you do what the Senate has since done and say you go to the Court of Appeals and essentially get review of what has already been found. Well, if you look at the laws that exist today and affects the EOC, there is a de novo hearing. The reason for that, of course, is that you get no hearing at the EOC. Congress, in its lack of wisdom, in my judgment, in 1964, was not willing to give hearing and enforcement powers to the EOC. And since under the Due Process Clause, people are entitled to a hearing at some point if it wants to go the full step. If you went to, if you went to court, you had to get a hearing. 
Um, in our procedure, we provide a hearing. Indeed, a hearing by an objective third person to ascertain the facts. So, in keeping with American law, everywhere but the EEOC, you ought to be able to go to the Court of Appeals afterwards. So the minority insisted, no, they wanted to know about hearing. Of course, that goes even against their own uh, view of, of litigation, because I'm sure they wouldn't want to have more litigation than we have. But those, that is an example of the kind of frustration that was in the process. We have a hearing. Nobody in his right mind in the litigious atmosphere of this country today would want to give anybody a second bite of any litigious apple. We ought to have been able to resolve that. We, of course, we, we, we were able to include the provision I speak about in, in, the, in, 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 in our recommendations, but it, it is an example of the kind I, I meant you to understand. Uh, before I indicate more about why I think uh, ethics and compliance with our laws, two areas in which we were successful in reaching some consensus are the meat of what the public was concerned with. Let me express my concern about uh, a recommendation regarding uh, committee assignments uh, and limitations. Uh, among other things, I have argued in my statement that limiting committee and subcommittee assignments would have a disparate racial impact by changing the rules in such a way as to eliminate blacks and other people of color from committee leadership opportunities. Uh, Mr. Chairman, blacks were elected in very small numbers to this body until very recently because of specific and societal discrimination. To this day, it is difficult for a person of color to be elected to this body unless there are a majority of people of his race. On the other hand, blacks vote and have voted uh, historically for whites to represent them. So there were very few of us early on. So when we come to the point of seniority, while there are many of us down in the bowels of the house, there's still a very few of us uh, there where the rest of you have been all along who could qualify for seniority. It's really an unintended consequence. But if you're, you're, you are among uh, the people of color in this country, you say, whoops, they changed the rules just when some of us get to the point where we could occupy leadership uh, positions. Um, I must say to you, Mr. Chairman, I think the benefits resulting from limited commi committees further, particularly in light of how, the, how the, the, the House has already proceeded to do so, uh, when compared with the trade-off of building in the effects of past and present racial discrimination uh, is simply not worth it. But to demonstrate that point, I think I have a burden and I think I can meet it of showing that there is a threshold major objection to limits on committee assignments that go well beyond the number of us who would be affected because of, 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 of the racial impact. I do not believe that among the great problems of the House is too many committee or subcommittee assignments. Uh, the House has succeeded in getting the number under substantial control in contrast to the Senate. The Senate is the body where members have numerous uh, waivers in order to be on co committees, and I'd like to submit uh, for the record um, in some detail not only my, my analysis of, of this issue, drawn from my own supplemental comments, but a memorandum showing uh, where the committee assignment problem rests. I simply have picked out some members of the Senate as an example of where waivers are rampant with an obvious effect on the business of the body. If we look, and, and I really, the, 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 I, I point to these members only because they fly up at you. There are many members of the Senate who look in the same way. Mr. Uh, Max uh, Bacchus has five committees and six subcommittees. Mr. DeConcini has eight committees and eight subcommittees. Um, Mr. Domenici has uh, six committees and ten subcommittees. Mr. Hatfield has six committees and eight subcommittees. Uh, Mr. Moynihan has six committees and nine subcommittees. Mr. Stevens has nine committees and 13 subcommittees. We don't have anything that looks like that in the House of Representatives. Uh, it is difficult to get a waiver to go on uh, a, a, a committee. I tried to get a waiver to go on judiciary. 
uh, have spent my life as a lawyer and a constitutional lawyer couldn't do it, couldn't get it. Um, there's a statement in our report that 72 members would exceed the limits on committee and subcommittee assignments contained uh, in the proposal. That's misleading. The number includes uh, members who sit on the District of Columbia Committee, uh, on the House Administration Committee, on the Standards, uh, uh, on the Ethics Committee, on Joint Committees. Uh, those under House rules are exempt, so they are not examples of where people have uh, exceeded their waivers. There are waivers. Uh, but one has the burden if one wants a waiver of getting one, and, when we, and it's not true that one in five. The number is far smaller than that in the House today. Um, and there would be a fair number of committees that would be affected, small business, government ops, post office and civil service. Uh, the district committee is a, is a committee that would be affected. And I don't think that the House can, in fact, uh, in good faith, either abolish the district committee Wish you would, wish you get out of our business altogether. But as long as you insist upon having to do, have uh, second guessing uh, the 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 residents uh, and the and the officials of the District of Columbia, then you're going to have to have a vehicle to do it. Couldn't put us under another committee without essentially abolishing Home Rule because people get on other committees, uh, such as government ops, for example, for reasons specific to that committee. And, many, and, and people are recruited to the district committee largely on, on the basis of the fact that they would respect home rule, at least the Democrats are, are recruited on that basis. So you'd put on the district committee, or you'd have on the district committee, uh, members who would feel that if they voted to uphold the democratic will of the residents of the district of committee, then their folks wouldn't like it. Well, their folks shouldn't have anything to do with my folks. And the way in which to get, get everybody politically out of that bind is to have a district committee. So I don't think the House would want to have it any other way. Those are the kind of unintended consequences that would flow from willy-nilly limiting uh, uh, the, 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 the numbers. Finally, Mr. Chairman, may I say that um, uh, in looking at what should be done with our recommendations, um, I ask you to put on the same lenses that the public is likely to put on in judging our recommendations. Um, I don't think that they are likely to go down the table of contents and say biennial budgeting, multiple referrals, scheduling, staff training, boy, those folks have really gotten at why we wanted them to study themselves. Much as, I must say, Mr. Chairman, those matters are of great importance to me and I hope to other members of, of the House. Nor do I believe that the, pre the pet provisions of the minority are why the public was disenchanted with the House, whether it is the, the, the proxy voting or even the realignment of committee jurisdictions and the, and the abolishment of the abolition of uh, joint uh, referrals. In judging this committee's work, uh, if we put on the, the, the same glasses that the public is likely, likely to do, I think we, we ought to ask ourselves what they would ask themselves. They would say, well, why, why, why did we want this committee in the first place? I forget, they would say. <laughs> I forget, that was the last session. What did they have in mind? And they say, oh, that's right. It was gridlock. They seemed not to be able to get anything done. And it was a kind of lack of confidence that I, I hesitate to say has been somewhat historic as to this body. But it was that, and it was those two things. I believe it's safe to say the gridlock had passed with the last um, session. I mean to say that procedures could not be better. I would like to see, be, see Lee's and other procedures improve. But I really do not believe that the record number of major enactments uh, from the last year documents the notion that gridlock continues to be a major problem in the Congress. What does continue to be a major problem with the Congress is a vote of no confidence by the public, not in our internal procedures, much as they are in need of repair and revision, uh, but based largely on two notions. One, that our, in our ethics, we are judged by ourselves, the fox watching the kitchen, uh, the, 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 chick, the, the fox in the chicken coop, so that the revision that, uh, allows or would allow 
third party fact finding, I think would be judged by the public as important. And secondly, of course, the notion that we would bring ourselves under the laws of the United States. I am not, I'm not bothered as Mr. Allard is that there, that there's some study. For goodness sakes, this is the Congress of the United States. We don't change our laws without uh, hearings or at least some study that would indicate whether or not what we're doing makes any sense. If we don't do it when we change application of our laws to others, I do not see how we can responsibly advocate that we change our laws without seeing what the effect would be uh, on ourselves. I, I stand ready uh, on some provisions right now where the effect is clear and where we have some, some experience to do the change because the change has in fact been, the reasons for the change have been borne out. We need to look at other changes and unless there is a very good reason why not that comes forward in the course of such a study, we ought to apply all relevant laws uh, to the Congress that are applied to those who send us here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Norton, very much for your testimony, which, again, I found uh, myself in personally total agreement with, especially your final point, you know, which you started out with, too. Uh, we do care, obviously, about what the, what, the, what the public cares about. We do care about rationalizing or making as rational as possible our internal procedures, but the latter is not what folks out there are most concerned about, I think. I think some of our Republican friends feel differently, but I think they're wrong about that. And it was helpful f uh, for you to, to put your finger on the problems of ethics and the problem of, of being included under the laws uh, that, we, that we proposed and passed to, to regulate other people's lives, to include ourselves under them. I think those are two profoundly important and necessary things, two areas in which your group apparently did quite a decent job, although perhaps we can look at extending it a bit further, and for which you deserve a lot of credit. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just add that there were three other things that the American people uh, were looking at when it came to formulation of this committee. House Bank, House Post Office, and House Restaurant. All come out under ethics. And we have reformed ethics. Or at least we would if you passed our, if you passed our recommendations. Thank you very much, ma'am. Appreciate it. And finally, not at all least, but only because she's the most recent arrival of the 12 members of this joint committee, and one whose testimony this gentleman is looking forward to because we agree about a very important phase of this, which not everybody agrees with us. We're pleased to have the, uh, the gentlewoman from the state of Washington, uh, Honorable Jennifer Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both for your patience. I suspect my speech has been given many times today, uh, but I appreciate your being willing to listen to the most junior member of the committee. It was an experience that I will never forget, having served on this committee for a year and through many hours of testimony, and one that has taught me a great deal about the institution, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. Mr. Chairman, I appear before you, as you say, with the distinction or perhaps the curse of being the only freshman member to have served on the Joint Committee. As such, I tried to provide not only a fresh viewpoint, but also a voice for our large 1992 freshman class. From that perspective, it probably surprises neither of you that I found our final report wanting. Virtually every witness we heard, it seemed, preached boldness, yet in the final stages we opted for what I saw as relatively meek reforms, what I've referred to as pastel changes. The majority of the freshman class, as far as I can tell, is frustrated by the glacial pace of congressional reform. I certainly am. I don't tend to go through, intend to go through all my objections, and I certainly do not mean to imply that our chairman, Representative Hamilton, did not do yeoman's duty. He had an unenviable task, the task of trying to work out agreements between groups of members with drastically different expectations and demands. What I would like to do in a very brief amount of time is to outline some thoughts I have on two themes that I feel most strongly about deliberation and credibility. First, deliberation. It appears that virtually all members believe uh, there should be more deliberation throughout the consideration uh, on the floor of the Congress of legislation. My freshman colleagues from both sides of the aisle have expressed surprise at how bills are passed out of some committees with absent members being voted by proxy how little they know about major pieces of legislation on which they must vote, 
and how their time is devoted to dashing from meeting to meeting rather than conducting and listening to meaningful debate and thoughtfully considering the best ideas from both sides of the aisle on any given issue. Most central to the lack of de uh, deliberation around here, I believe, is the frustrating three-day legislative week. We run around frantically from Tuesday afternoon until mid-afternoon on Thursday, and then members fly off in all directions. We need a more rational approach, and uh, I was very heartened, Mr. Chairman, to read of your strong endorsement of some scheduling changes. I myself am a proponent of the idea that we ought to adopt the so-called three-on-one-off schedule that Representative Romer and more than 100 other House members have advocated in which the Senate is supposed to be following. This is the schedule proposal that would provide for three full work weeks here in the Capitol and one week in our districts each month. As we all know, the problems discussed back home are often starkly different from the ones that we talk about here in Washington, D.C., and we need to be there to hear those concerns. So I am one who believes that we all would benefit if both the House and the Senate uh, had the will to adhere to a three-on-one-off schedule. The Joint Committee recommended going to a four-day work week. I hope that during the process we'll have the chance to ask House members if they would prefer the bolder three-on-one-off approach that I favor, which includes the five-day work week. Uh, in addition to giving us a decent amount of time to be home in our districts, listening to the taxpayers, I believe it would make our time here more sane, more productive, and more deliberative. Another key to increasing the deliberative nature of the Congress is to address proxy voting. I understand that this committee operates without proxies, despite having one of the heaviest hearing schedules on the Hill. If members knew that they had to show up to cast their votes, it would do two good things. It would increase the level of deliberation on, at hearings by requiring more members to be present uh, to attend in order to hear the testimony and the discussion. And it would provide a disincentive uh, to serving on too many committees. If a member serves on too many committees and can't vote by proxy, he or she will generate the liability of a very poor committee attendance record. I'm pleased to say that the respective leaders of the Democrat and Republican freshman class task forces on reform, Representatives Fingerhut, Shepard, Fowler, and Torkelson, co-signed a letter to the Joint Committee endorsing a ban on proxy voting at the full committee level. They too saw this as a way to increase two, true bipartisan deliberation at the committee level by encouraging greater member participation. Increased member participation would provide us the opportunity to rely less on staff. Numerous members admitted in testimony to our committee that they believe we've become over-reliant on staff, especially committee staff, since the members are so busy rushing ra back and forth from meeting to meeting. This, I realize, is one part of the Joint Committee report that will have to be pursued with House administration, and as a member of that committee, I intend to continue pursuing cutbacks to committee staffs, partly as a means to increase member involvement and deliberation. And I will continue to speak out on the need to give one-third of committee staff funding to the minority. I believe that's a basic question of fairness and represents not only the policy of the Senate, but the policy that this House passed several years ago, only to see it rescinded by the Majority Party Caucus. All of these areas, scheduling, proxy voting, over-reliance on staff, undermine our ability to deliberate effectively on behalf of the folks from our district. And all of them also undermine the credibility of the institution. Constituents who see us running around from Tuesday to Thursday can't possibly be impressed with our thoughtfulness. Taxpayers who witness the high absentee rate at many committee hearings, courtesy of the proxy vote, can't possibly feel confident about the legislative product of these meetings. And voters who watch members take their every cue from staff can't possibly believe that members really know the details of the massive bills that we consider and pass. Beyond these, though, there's one more item tied to credibility of the institution that was rejected by the Joint Committee, and that's the Sunshine Act. Right now, the rules of the House allow a member or a hearing to be closed if a majority of any committee's membership is present and votes to close that meeting for any purpose. And the rules also state that media coverage of the Congress is a privilege when I believe it should be considered a right. So tax law, for example, 
uh, as demonstrated in the closing of the Ways and Means Committee last spring, is written behind closed doors, outside the view of the political process, the watchdog press, or certainly the members of the public who vote for the process, or who pay for the process. I think we could take a big step toward rebuilding credibility and public confidence in Congress simply by making a very simple change to our rules to allow the sun to shine in on virtually all our official meetings. You would, of course, continue to make exception for national security and for the potential defamation of a member's uh, uh, reputation. At a time when the American people hold the Congress in very low esteem, dangerously low esteem, and when the Congress is increasing its partisanship rather than decreasing it, as I believe we should, if there were one imperative of overriding concern uh, from my freshman colleagues, it would be make the system more open, more accessible, and more understandable to the voters. We didn't do that, in my view. Uh, many changes should be made, or at the least, uh, at the very least, discussed before the full House and allowed to be voted on by that body. Uh, at the appropriate time, I'm sure we'll all be back here pleading for amendments to be made uh, in order. And at that time, I will submit that uh, having given a huge portion to our 1993 deliberations on this joint committee uh, during this process that included many hours of time and many, many hundreds of pages of testimony from hundreds of witnesses, that I, I will support that every member of the joint committee be allowed to offer at least one amendment to this bill. For now, though, I simply urge this committee to keep the process moving. Please do not further water down any of the provisions. Please consider the bolder op options on scheduling, sunshine, and proxy voting that do not uh, exist in this uh, uh, form of the proposal. And please ultimately give our, us freshmen the opportunity to argue for the bold reforms we believe necessary to the credibility of the Congress in which we serve. In closing, Mr. Chairman, let me just add that I believe bolder changes are necessary not for partisan purposes, but to make the Congress better regardless of which party is in control. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Dunn. Um, let me say that I agree with you completely about proxy voting and about relying less on staff. Uh, we have a vote on, and, we're, and we've been here for some time, so I'll, I'll, I'm just going to ask you one question if I may, because as you know, we, we agree largely on the respect to the need to change scheduling and the importance of scheduling. I mean, I, unless it's obvious, I think, self-evident to me, and I know to you, but not to everybody around here, that if we're not here physically for a certain, you know, minimal amount of time, there's no way in the world we can do the, the work that's, you know, that we should be doing. You can't do it in, in a two-day week, which is really what we have now, two half days and one full day on Wednesday. But my question to you is this. Our friend Mr. Al Swift, who's served, on, as you know, on the Joint Committee with you, and whom I find to be a particularly persuasive and thoughtful person, um, raised some, some questions as to how well the three weeks on and one week off proposal might work. That's something which I, I think I, I favor and which I, I believe you favor, too. He suggested an alternative, as you may know, of, of Monday, Tuesday, that, that, we, that we vote on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. Uh, which would get people here and, in effect, require them to be here or force them to be here because there would be recorded votes, that Wednesday, not that, not that committees couldn't meet on those other days, but Wednesday would be turned over simply, you know, for, for committee meetings. Um, sounded like a sensible suggestion. I don't know if it's any better than the ones that you and I prefer, uh, but I was just wondering if, if, you'd had any, if you had any thoughts about that or whether he propounded that at any length in your committee in your committee discussions and whether it makes some sense to you. I, I, I think highly too, uh, Mr. Swift, he is uh, a member of my state's delegation and I think that he speaks wisdom most of the time. Um, I, I think that, and I have discussed his proposal with him in his office, it was one of a couple of dozen uh, meetings that I, that I took part in because I needed to learn the process uh, more than the other members of the committee who had served here longer. Uh, I think that, that um, uh, there is a way to make compromise on this. I think that the three weeks here in Washington, D.C. and one week in the district have a couple of major advantages. One is that that process, if it were adopted by the House, would coincide with what the Senate adopted some years ago, a change that was sponsored by a former senator from my state, Senator Dan Evans. Uh, but I think that one of the other very important goals of three and one is that we spend a full week at home in the district. Uh, what we're missing here is the time to call on folks who live at home in our district who are talking about concerns of the district. 
Uh, for me, it's the trails on Mount Rainier or the, the delta that needs to be dredged in the Cedar River. Uh, lots of problems that really aren't going to get specific attention here in the capital. And where our responsibility certainly includes debate and thoughtfulness on national issues, we must pay attention to what people who depend on us as their representatives find important. So if we can combine what he's suggesting, uh, which sounds to me like a, basically a four-day work week, I would like to see turn into five with one week of concentrated effort per month in our district, then I would be willing to support that. Yeah. No, I, must, I must say I agree with you too. Um, we, we, go back, we go back often on, on weekends and you do what you can on the weekend. You have town hall meetings and you meet in your office with people who want to see you, but there's certain things you cannot do if you're not there on weekdays. There are certain groups you, can never, you never have a chance to talk to right. or to meet with because they meet on weekdays or weeknights. Um, and you find out, we find that we had two months off recently, the longest time we've had off, I guess, all the years we've been here, David. Mm -hmm. um, and the other and all point, kinds of groups um, out there I didn't even know about because they don't, you know, I never get to see them right. on the weekends when we're home ordinarily. And they can't all afford to come to Washington, D.C. No, we don't want them all coming here. It. It's better to... And you get to meet with them next week. <laughs> That's right. That's but we're, we're all West Coasters, too, and I think there's some advantage to us in not having to sit on planes for hours and hours uh, every week in oh, the I way agree. many of us do. If we could spend one week at home, I think we'd make much wiser use of our time. You know, under a three-week, three-day two weeks on, one week off, if it were enforced, which apparently it's not been according to some of the members in the Senate, we'd have, you know, 15 work days here in a month, uh, whereas now if you just have, say, really two, two and a half uh, days a week is what we have now times four is what, Maximum eight, eight 12, or ten, 12, yeah, 12 yeah. maybe, but it's not really 12. Nothing happens Tuesday morning, nobody's here Tuesday mornings. Can't get people to committees on Tuesday mornings because mm -hmm. they haven't arrived yet. Anyway, thanks. Mr. Dreyer. Well, let me ask one quick thing, if I may, of, of either or both of you. Uh, the committee I'm not is a witness here. The committee, is, we're going to swear you in as a witness in just a moment. The, the committee mentioned that one of its, one of its proposals is a four-day week. Do, do you recall what's, what's, how, it's, how it's proposed? Are they just talking about having votes on four, day, on, on four days a week? Uh, they're talking about, like, do you know, I mean, with this, do they have any way of enforcing it? So we'll look at it. I just yeah. wonder. So much, so much depends on the will of the leadership, and I think that's right now where we have to concentrate okay. some serious effort. Sure. So Mr. Dreyer, for a question from Ms. Yeah, Dunn. Just, sure, there were just some general statements in there on it. Um, first of all, let me uh, congratulate you as a new member. As you said, Jennifer, you came in, hit the ground running, and have done a great deal on this issue of reform. I've been very concerned on this whole issue. There are now 115 new members of Congress. It seems to me, from having observed that, that the Democrats have gone off in one direction, the Republicans in another. And I've had repeated meetings with Democrat freshman reformers, Republican freshman reformers. I even talked to some senior members at some point. But, uh, and uh, we had testimony before our committee on, uh, from reformers and the leadership of each uh, Democrat and Republican freshman class. And I've just been very concerned about about the fact that they seem to have gone off in uh, <clears throat> different directions. I mean, do you have you concluded that? Uh, I think it was much. Uh, it was very true, especially at the beginning of 1993. Uh, toward the end of the year, I've become more and more encouraged that there are many Democrat freshmen who are interested in reform at the same level that the freshman Republicans are. Mm -hmm. We are obviously on my side of the aisle freer. We don't owe fealty to leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not sitting around waiting to be put on a top-level committee since we're in the minority and we don't control. Uh, but regardless, uh, there are many members of the Democrat freshman class who have uh, made campaign promises and have uh, listened to the members of their constituencies uh, who have said we want reform in this house, we want it to work better regardless of who is in control. And uh, those are the folks that I see being willing to back some of these uh, solutions that we've proposed that weren't in the bill. That's why I'd like, to, I'd like to see some of these things make it through the Rules Committee onto the floor. I believe we could have some very good solid reform made if we were allowed to uh, put to a test on the vote uh, on the floor of the House, some of these reforms that seem so obvious that many Democrats and Republicans. You wrote a nice support. article in the in the Washington Times the other day, and I'd ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, to include that in the record. That's the local follow. Washington Times, or something back home in your state of Washington? No, you know, this is the local uh, Washington Times. No, 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 I'm not sure. I'll, and okay, it, without. <laughs> are you going to object? Or? No, without. Okay. No, um, there'd be no objection. To answer no. your question, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, on scheduling, it says under this sense of the House proposal. 
Uh, the schedule for the House of Representatives should provide for one of four day legislative week, two specific and exclusive periods during which only floor proceedings or only committee meetings and hearings may be held, three minimizing scheduling conflicts between and among committees and subcommittees, and four encouragement of the use of the present computerized scheduling system. So basically what that is saying is that it's up to the leadership to make the decision. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, let me just say that you were very uh, attentive and uh, a very valued member of our joint committee and you worked uh, diligently throughout the process to attend hearings and I was very impressed with your work. Thank you. It was my pleasure to serve. Thank, thank you, you ma'am, for your Chairman. testimony. And thank you, Mr. Dreyer, for your attendance today. And we are adjourned. <laughs>